Welcome to the Atheist and Christian Book Club. We are a monthly gathering of both uh, believers and skeptics, respectfully discussing important books from both perspectives. Uh, we usually alternate a Christian book one month, Atheist book the next month. My name is James Walker. I am president of an evangelical Christian ministry called Watchman Fellowship, an apologetics ministry focusing primarily on interfaith evangelism. Our other co-host, which you'll meet in a little while, is uh, Bill Cluck, former Christian, now atheist. And we have a special guest author. We usually have the author with us um, and uh, the, for the last several years. And uh, with us is uh, Dr. Justin Batts. The book we're going to be looking at in a moment is called The Bedrock of Christianity. Uh, Dr. Bass is a, has a PhD from Dallas Theological Seminary in New Testament studies. He's received a master's degree uh, from DTS and uh, his uh, undergraduate work in, uh, in uh, business in the area of entrepreneurship uh, from SMU, Southern Methodist University. Uh, Dr. Bass has lived in Amman, Jordan uh, before COVID, uh, serving refugees through an NGO and teaching as a professor there of the New Testament at uh, Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary. He's also served uh, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area as lead pastor of the 1042 Church in Frisco, Texas, and uh, as uh, taught as professor at both Dallas Christian College as well as uh, DTS's alma mater. Uh, he's formally debated a number of uh, prominent atheists, including Dan Barker, uh, Dr. Richard Carrier, and Dr. Bart Ehrman. The, um, the latter two have been also guest authors here uh, with us at the Atheist and Christian Book Club. Uh, Justin, welcome to the club. Thank you so much for having me. Honored. Well, we've been looking forward to doing your book. It was a pleasure to read it. Uh, I, kinda, I really liked your approach. You know, it's bedrock, and there's a theme throughout the whole book, the bedrock facts, uh, kind of a unique approach uh, of um, you, you were talking about uh, Jesus, the resurrection, the gospel, but the, you wanted to focus on things that almost in, anyone, 99, more than 99% of the scholars, whether they are evangelical, Catholic, uh, uh, whether they are um, atheist, agnostic, uh, if whether in, in the field of antiquities or, or um, uh, the biblical studies, that the vast majority, over 99% of the scholars out there, are going to agree. It's, it re kind of reminded me of uh, what Gary Habermas does with the resurrection on his, his minimal facts approach. Uh, let's start with common ground. Let's start with areas that, that even uh, you know, Bart Ehrman, the agnostic uh, New Testament scholar, would say, yes, uh, you know, the, these are things that we would agree on. And uh, I really like that approach. Now, you did say there is this 1% of uh, people that uh, would deny even these bedrock facts, and those would be especially our friends who are mythicists. And best I can tell it at our book club, maybe about half of, of our um, of our um, uh, club members either are mythicist or agnostic on the question of was there a historical Jesus. But, but the idea for the mythicist, uh, these are there are atheists who not only say that there was a man, Jesus, who um, maybe wasn't supernatural, didn't rise from the dead, maybe he was a misunderstood Jewish rabbi or, or, or a, um, uh, you know, just a, a healer or a miracle worker of the day, but he certainly uh, none of the supernatural uh, elements of the Bible would apply. Well, the, these, these uh, mythicists go way further than that, saying there never really was a man, Jesus, and um, including, in fact, last month in our book club, uh, we had uh, Robert Price, who is one of the top mythicist uh, writers. Uh, we looked at his book. He co-authored with John Loftus called uh, variations of a uh, mythicist uh, mythos, Jesus mythicism did he even exist uh, and uh, they laid out the case there was no historical Jesus and um, in fact there was a whole chapter we talked a little bit about in the book club uh, a um, where they made the one of the one of the possible explanations was that Jesus was actually code that the New Testament uh, early Christians were actually involved in hallucinogenics and taking 
um, uh, uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms, uh, psychedelic mushrooms. And so every time it talks about Jesus, it was actually code for taking these mushrooms and the John Allegro and the sacred mushroom and the cross. And so there was a tedious whole chapter trying to make that case. So uh, let's just that, talk that, about that. that. I was just going to say that that's actually the the viewpoint of the great theologian Joe Rogan as well. Whoa, unbelievable! I did not know about about Rogan. I've been Rogan, had been Rogan following John through. Allegro for many years, and uh, there there is still a a fan base and uh, a core group of people that still follow it. Even though I would consider that kind of the lunatic fringe, even for the mythicists. But uh, yeah. but can we t address that first of all? Can you kind of put to bed? Uh, the idea that uh, that Jesus never even existed uh, can we can we really close the door on that less than one percent of the scholars out there? Yeah, you know it's it's just real frustrating that I can't say a hundred percent because the mythicists would just come over and with Ehrman and the rest of, of the scholars and just agree that you know there was a historical man named Jesus, he was crucified. Then I can say a hundred percent, but yeah, um, I, I think I think it, the, the evidence is just overwhelming for Jesus's existence. Uh, especially when you compare him to other historical figures from the ancient world, you know, you know, the, the go-to place, of course, would be Paul's early letters. That's where I start because that's just the place also where, you know, these are the sources that are agreed upon by everyone that Paul wrote them, and even mythicists agree that Paul wrote these letters that they date to, you know, the early 50s A.D. And so we're talking within about 20 years, you know, 10, 15 years, in the case of Galatians, of of Jesus's crucifixion, and Paul himself knew Peter. He was a chief disciple. He knew James, uh, who he says was Jesus' brother. And then you have that awesome, I think amazing, you know, parallel with Paul saying in Galatians that uh, James is the brother of Jesus. And then you have Josephus, who I, I don't think he wrote, he read Galatians. I don't think he was reading Paul. And Josephus, later on, towards the end of the first century, says there was a guy named James who was stoned to death, and he, he the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ. And so you have that amazing independent testimony. Again, something that's pretty pretty unparalleled in the ancient world to have something, especially from a non-biased source, ag in agreement like that. And so if, Jan if Jesus had a brother, he probably existed. Um, so, so I would say that the Paul's early letters would be the, the, the starting place that, that is the kind of common ground where everyone agrees on that. Uh, even the mythicists agree that, that Paul's letters are legitimate and historical, and there was a Paul, and there was a Peter. That's, that's what I find interesting. When I've talked about this, I'll have a list of names from the, you know, from the ancient world. And, and if you have John the Baptist, you have Peter, you have James, you have Pilate, you have you know, Tiberius Caesar, and then you have Jesus, and you have, so you have this long list, and for some reason, it's Jesus who doesn't exist. <laughs> but they agree all the others exist. So, so I'm, I'm always, I always find that fascinating. What, what is it about Jesus? Maybe it's because he claimed to be the Son of God, and only through him is eternal life. I don't know. It, it could be. I don't that, know. But it could yeah, be that. even uh, Bart Ehrman, who um, uh, is is a skeptic, New Testament critic, and uh, he wrote a, a very good book, short book, uh, that Jesus certainly existed and made the case against mythicism. Um, so even though the mythicists love to quote Bart Ehrman and rely upon his scholarship, when it comes to that book, uh, it, we're hard pressed to get the mythicists to even be willing to look at Bart Ehrman's book on the historicity of Jesus. Yeah, yeah and, and, and that's where Bart would go in, in his book, Did Jesus Exist? He, he focuses on Paul's letters, but then he'll say, you know, we actually have a lot of historical information in the gospels that we can trust. He, he you know, thinks a ton of it's not true. But he also says there's a ton of it that is true. You know, Jesus was crucified. You know, Jesus was uh, uh, bad, baptized by John the Baptist. He was, uh, at least people believed he was a miracle worker. People believed he was an exorcist. Um, there's a ton of things that he said. You can go through Bart Ehrman's books, which I have. You can list out all the things that Jesus actually said, and it's m more sayings than even the Jesus Seminar would say that Jesus said historically. So, so we, we have a ton of historical information about Jesus, even if we just start at the uh, place of someone as skeptical as a, as a Bart Ehrman. Well, it's not only Bart Ehrman. John Dominic sure. Crossan said that there's two things that are certain historically. One, that he was Jesus was baptized by baptized by the uh, John the Baptist and that he was crucified. And Dale Allison, who we were talked about, said, uh, we think the crucifixion's a historical event because it had King of the Jews, which Christians didn't refer to him as that. They would have put 
it's, you know, Lord, right. Son of God, or whatever. Yeah, that, that's one of those I would call bedrock facts from the Gospels, that the fact that it said, it said King of the Jews nailed to that cross. That's one of the things that uh, incredibly, uh, incredibly now, actually you, written. Yeah, now on your bedrock facts, um, just so, so we make sure everybody's on the same page on that, when you say uh, there are certain facts uh, that, uh, that is, for example, uh, that Paul believed and the disciples believed that Jesus did rise from the dead, they believe that. You're, you're not saying that the atheist agnostic scholars agree that Jesus did rise from the dead. What the consensus is that you're saying is that virtually everybody agrees that, uh, that they thought he rose from the dead, that they proclaimed he rose from the dead, that that was their testimony. So that kind of gives us a common ground to talk about it. So again, you, you get the idea sometimes from, from some of the agnostic and atheist scholars that, uh, oh, well, the gospels are anonymous books that were written decades and decades after the events. And so who knows the, the uh, Jonine tradition and what, what may have led to this, uh, production of this gospel, maybe 50, 70 years later, we, we have no idea. Uh, but what you're doing is on the bedrock facts is you're going back. And that's why I like you start with Paul. Let's get really, really close to the crucifixion within, uh, you know, 20 years of, of writing letters, but making historical reference to things that happened um, just a couple of years after Jesus' crucifixion, or in some cases, perhaps even when you're talking about the creeds, um, some of the creedal statements that are in Paul's writings, you may be talking about even months. Can you, can you address that for us real briefly? Yeah, and just, just a quick a parallel I think that, that would, that's helpful is, for example, the historical David. And so you know, there, was, there was a time that scholars would say, you know, there were many scholars who would say there was no David. He was someone that was made up by the Jews like, you know, like Hector was made up by the, by the Greeks or Achilles or something like that. But then in 1993, we discovered the, what's called the Beit David steel, and, and it has, you know, uh, dating to about 100 years after David died, it says, Beit David, it says, House of David, and it's this Aramean king talking about how he conquered and was victorious against kingdom of David. And so now the minimalist of, of, the, of the Old Testament scholars would say, okay, there was a David, there was a kingdom, but I'm still skeptical. We still don't believe that all the things that are said in Samuel about David are true. And so it's, it's kind of like that. But I would say we have way more evidence for Jesus and for the gospels and for reasoning to, to accept that than we do ab about David. But it would but be like that. That's the common ground. We can start with David. Okay, there was a David. He had a kingdom. Okay, so now what can we know is true about David from the books of Samuel and Chronicles? I don't think this is in your book, but um, uh, there was a, a discovery that's just publicized here recently uh, in the last couple of months of the oldest uh, writing, including the, the sacred name yod heh vav -He or Yahweh, uh, of any writing known, which really addresses the issue of uh, that many of the scholars, uh, skeptical sc scholars and liberal scholars would argue that the, that the Old Testament was written uh, during the Babylonian captivity because nobody knew how to write earlier than that. There was no known writing uh, ability to write. Uh, and this is a paleo Hebrew script, which includes the divine name Yahweh, that is centuries uh, before the uh, Babylonian captivity. Are, you, of course. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, yes. And uh, can you can you address that for a second? Does that does that bring does that uh, address the issue of could there be a, a Bible writing taking place much earlier than the Babylonian captivity? I think if that's if it's a legitimate find and it's you know once it gets peer reviewed and everyone agrees this you know again it's a bedrock fact. Unbelieving scholars and you know archaeologists and believing scholars all agree it's solid like the Beit David document, then yeah, I think that would, it would support that. I, I've heard about it, but I haven't studied it in detail. But it is fascinating if, uh, if, if you can show now the name Yahweh goes all the way back pre-Babylonian captivity. What is the curse? It go, it's, it's a reference to, I think, the curses of Deuteronomy, you know, when they stand on Mount Ebal and they stood on Mount Gerizim, and from Mount Gerizim they would pronounce the blessings, and then on Mount Ebal they would pronounce the curses. And of course Yahweh would be you know, part of that, if you go Yahweh, back to Deuteronomy. Yahweh curse you. Huh? Yahweh curse you instead of Yahweh yeah. bless you. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. 
the the other thing that uh, I, th- I thought was very interesting is by starting with Paul, you you get away from the whole question of how how late are the gospels. I'll ask you in a minute when you would date Mark's gospel, for example. But how late the gospels m- may be, or that they're anonymous sources. Uh, a lot of the uh, of the liberal scholars, uh, skeptical scholars, would say that we don't know who wrote any of the gospels. That the uh, names attributed to them um, were, were probably not written by them, but when you're dealing with Paul, and this is especially with the mythicists, I find this amazing. Why would they? Why would they agree that Paul's a historical person? It's like all these people are make believe fiction, except Paul. Now he's a real person, and so the, the, you talk about the seven undisputed letters of Paul. And even the skeptical scholars, even the Bart Ehrmans of the world, are going to say that there really was a historical Paul who really wrote Galatians, who really wrote the Corinthians. So could, could you talk about that a minute? Yeah, it's amazing. Even uh, I remember when I was reading through uh, Richard Carrier's um, On the History of Jesus, even he, not only Paul's letters, but he actually makes a case for Peter being the, uh, le- the actual author of uh, First Peter. So he's, he doesn't go all the way, but he's like, there's actually good arguments for uh, the fact that First Peter was written by, uh, the, you know, Peter, whoever Peter was. I don't fully understand how you get a Peter when the, when he's not the chief disciple of Jesus. But, but yeah, so when, it, when you come to today, like uh, if, you, if you go across modern scholarship today, across the board, they would agree on those seven. There, there's seven uh, undisputed letters of Paul. Can you but, list those? I mean, yeah. you've got Galatians. And yeah, it's Galatians, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, uh, Philemon, and uh, Philippians, I said Philemon. Colossians, Ephesians. Not Colossians, not Ephesians. Well, that's one of the... Uh, First Thessalonians. Yeah. First Thessalonians. That's the seven. But in my book, I talk about how if you go back all the way to the beginning of really biblical scholarship, so the last 250 years of biblical critical, you know, critical biblical scholarship, it really narrows down to four. So you see, it narrows down to even four of Paul's letters because there were a lot of German scholars that were pretty skeptical of even some of these others. So, so when you get down to it, it's actually just First uh, Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Romans, Galatians. But just on those four, that's what I base pretty much my bedrock facts from. So I show how even from those, you know bedrock sources, you get the bedrock facts that I lay out uh, concerning the resurrection. Yeah, they don't believe the pastorals like uh, Timothy and so forth because they talk about bishops. There weren't any bishops during Paul's writings and so forth. And Ephesians have these really long sentences, so they have reasons for what they say. They just don't. Philippians, though, does Paul mentions bishops. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he does? Okay. So is, it, is it the Justin, is it the style of the writing that uh, caused the, the scholars some concern? Yeah, I, I, I see the arguments at least with the pastorals. The pastorals would be 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. Uh, when it comes to Ephesians and Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, these are letters that, that have a, ni- a nice little split. There are still some more liberal scholars that will accept them as Pauline, and then there's um, many who don't accept them. Uh, but when you look at those, I mean, with the Greek, I mean, I read the Greek, I mean, to me, it's Paul. I mean, I, I don't see any why there's a debate here. But when it comes to the pastorals, the Greek is different. And one theory is the reason behind that is these are actually the most personal, other than Philemon, this, these are the most personal letters Paul wrote, and he may have written them uh, in situations where he didn't have an amanuensis. An amanuensis mm-hmm. would be someone who dicta- you know, he would write for him while he would speak, and that's how Paul wrote most of his letters. That's how many you know, in the ancient world wrote their letters. Uh, we know he wrote Romans that way. At the end, Tertius comes in. Comes in. He shows himself the actual writer of hey, Romans. I'm the guy right here. <laughs> hey, Tertius, oh. Tertius also sent you greetings. And uh, so, so, so that's why First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus may not be. Um, so it's like the difference colloquially. It's like the difference if I write a, a letter to my mom versus a letter to a church yeah. asking for mm-hmm. funds or something like that. That's right. Yeah. And and the theology is a little bit different in some places than some of his earlier letters like his views on marriage and family, but my view is it's just because of the circumstances. I think because Paul is writing the pastorals, you know, almost 20-something years later than he wrote Corinthians, it's, you know, now he's, you know, experiencing a whole different kind of world. Jesus may not be coming back before I die. I need to tell these people to (laughs) get married, have kids, you know, who knows, maybe it's the next generation when Jesus will come back. You know, Paul, I think, believe Jesus was coming back you don't actually, real soon. You don't actually believe Paul wrote Timothy, right? No, I believe he wrote Timothy. 
oh, well, he's telling the, you know, women shut up in church. Go ask your husbands. And in Paul's other letters, it's like he has a high regard for women. Well, he, right? in 1 Corinthians 14, he says just about the same thing about women need to, to be... Uh, um, oh, so it was a chauvinist throughout well, the... <laughs> well, well my, my, but my view on those passages is that uh, there, there are differences in opinion of Christians on those, but my view is that they are cultural situations in those particular churches that Paul is dealing with. There was clearly some women getting new freedoms that they had never had, and as a result, it was causing disruptions and issues in those churches, but this wasn't a situation for all uh, churches, and, and uh, evidence for that would be 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says when women are praying or prophesying in the church, have them wear the veils. And so uh, women are prophesying and praying publicly, and prophesying is a form of exhortation, right. teaching. You know, so 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 for Paul, you know, I think it's a it's a specifically cultural uh, thing that's going on there. So it's the it's the eternal principle that we would we would take on that there needs to be order in the church, kind of thing. But I think I think Paul. As we see Paul empower people like Phoebe is a deaconess who he entrusts with the, the, the masterpiece of Romans, right. you know, to take to, to the church. So, so I think Paul was uh, very much pro women, and there is no male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Justin, on, on page 19 of your book, this is one thing I remember when we talked uh, two summers ago, our interview. I don't know if I mentioned the interview, but uh, this one occurrence of this one word that appears nowhere else in the New Testament, where Paul goes and gets information from Peter. The historico. Yeah. History. That's a fast. That was a fascinating little thing. Can you speak a little bit about what the, what's going on there? <coughs> yeah, this is in uh, Galatians one. Um, one eighteen. Uh, one eighteen. It's one eighteen, where Paul mentions that he went to three years after his conversion. So that's why we date this to around if Paul was converted in AD thirty four. You know, about a year and a half after Jesus was crucified, he was crucified thirty three. Then three years later would be. 37 AD. So in 37 AD, uh, Paul is hanging out with Peter in uh, Jerusalem for 15 days, for, for, for two weeks, uh, which is incredible. You know, what did they do? What did they, you know, I think it's, it doesn't take much imagination to think about what they talked about. They talked about Jesus. They talked about these incredible things. And I think a support for that is that Greek word that Paul uses only here. He says, I sought out information. The historeo has a history in Greek, <laughs> literally a history in Greek. It comes from the father of history, Herodotus. He's the first to really use this. And so uh, Paul using that on purpose to say, I sought out historical information from Peter. Yeah, the, because I mean, Paul didn't know a ton of the things about the public ministry of Jesus. All he knew about Jesus was he was crucified. He thought he was cursed of God to bring back the curse. And he appeared to him. And so now his whole world has been turned upside down. How is this crucified man, the Lord of the world, how is he risen again from the dead? i got to put all this together so he wrestles with the Old Testament and going to see Peter and some of these earliest apostles was another part of that process. And the other thing, Justin, it's he kind of says it in passing. I kind of went down. It doesn't seem to be an agenda. Is that one reason we think it's historical? Yeah, yeah. That, that is one, one of the reasons why scholars see it as he's not he, bragging he about Yeah, he doesn't seem not, to be. Yeah, he's yeah, not he says, making, uh, making a big deal about NASB it. NASB right. says, I went up uh, to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas. Yeah. The very ca different like translations. Casual, yeah, different translations render it, but there's a, a, I went to seek historical information. I went to seek information from. But there's other Greek words to mean, I would say, like to just greet, to just meet with, you know. Mm -hmm. But this one. This is word is a word that means, I think, because some, some, I can't remember which, which translation, but some will say he sought out historical Well, information. speaking of that, you know, you seem to put a lot of weight on what Paul says uh, concerning the historical Jesus. You've heard this, I'm sure. One of the problems of Paul, validation of the Christian faith, is he doesn't seem to know about Jesus' miracles. He never mentions his parables. He doesn't mention his teachings when they could support his view. So don't you find that problematic in using Paul as a resource? Yeah, it, it's, it's a good point. I think one, one thing is Paul's not writing gospels. He's writing letters, and, and he's, you know, he's in this... <laughs> Action packed. You just read Second Corinthians eleven. His little mini autobiography of, of what he's experiencing. You know, he's being stoned. He's being, and I'm not talking about weed. He's being he's being you know you know shipwrecked. He's he's being whipped. He's being beaten all the time. He's he's, he's launching these letters off and quickly probably speaking to these people, dictating to just you know deal with whatever the church problems are. And so when he can reference the historical Jesus, he does. So for example, in Philippians two, he points back to the humility of Jesus. 
to push against their, you, you know, you, you know, being prideful and usurping authority over each other. So he says, in humility, have the same attitude of Christ Jesus. And he does the same thing in Romans 15. He points back to, uh, you know, when Jesus was insulted, he didn't insult other people. You know, that's referring straight back to when Jesus was being beaten and spit upon. He didn't fight back. Um, uh, hey, Bill, uh, along those lines, Bart Ehrman makes a good, a good point. He says his mother, Bart's mother, is a very devout Christian, but if you were to read all her letters, even though a lot of them deal with religious themes and spiritual themes, she rarely mentions events in the life of Jesus. It doesn't mean she doesn't know them. You said, you know, Paul doesn't seem to know about these things. Well, certainly Bart Ehrman's mother knows about the, the life of Christ as recorded in the Gospels. But, but the occasion of the letter is uh, not the time to, to bring up. You're not trying to do a, a history of Jesus as much as you're trying to address specific you know, theological issues. So I don't know if that helps you or not, Bill. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Now, I was going to say on the teachings, you know, sometimes Paul will directly say, this is not my opinion, this is what the Lord himself said. So he actually directly quotes some things about what Jesus said that we find in the Gospels on marriage. He, he quotes Jesus. The longest quotation he, he gives of Jesus I talk about in the book is from the Lord's table. So he actually knows what Jesus said when he took the bread and he took the cup and then he was betrayed by, you know, he doesn't say Judas, but he says on the night he was betrayed, you know, he took bread and he, and he said this is the blood of the new covenant. So he knows those stories. And, and he also, like in Romans uh, 12, when he talks about, you know, don't betray evil with evil, you know, if you're, if you're cursed, bless them. Uh, you know, love your enemies. Uh, you know, so so we see Jesus's teachings being, I think, alluded to all throughout. But but I think it's because it's letters that he's not. You know, hey, let me just tell you this great story about about Jesus right here. But but I think we do see a lot of it. Well, if, if you go deep into what he what the words are and what the what everybody agrees with you that the letters are early and there are early creedal statements that go back <clears throat> before Paul. My problem is with the Gospels. Because here's my feeling, okay? I read your book. I really enjoyed it, and I would recommend it to people. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. Uh, but in my view, Jesus is unknown and unknowable. The reason I say that is we cannot, you know, there have been four historical quests for the historical Jesus all ended in failure. And we can never really know the person of Jesus. You know, the views now are he was an apocalyptic prophet who had a bad weekend in Jerusalem, or uh, that's uh, Bart Ehrman and Dale Allison's view. He was best viewed as an apocalyptic prophet who was a failed apocalyptic prophet. And that's N.T. Wright's view, but, but, but N.T. Wright would say he was right. Yeah, and then you have John Dominic Crossan, who believes that um, he was a sage or cynic, not someone cynical, but someone that mm -hmm. lived off the lay of the land or whatever, and he had these aphoristic sayings, these short, pithy sayings. And, but, so those are the two views. Which one do you think is correct? <coughs> Well, I, I think I think that th this is one of the things that, in a way, supports I would say the orthodox position of Jesus, which is that ultimately Jesus is the God Man. He is the Word made flesh. He is. Well, that's not an option, obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, nobody believes that except fundamentalists. But go ahead. Well, N.T. Wright believes that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but, hey. Uh, <laughs> Hey, Bill, you know, you're hard-pressed to say that Jesus was fa failed when he's the founder of the world's largest religion. I mean, that's not a, like a complete failure, right? So let's put it this way. Good point. There was 14 other messianic so-called pretenders around Jesus about, you know, 40 years before Jesus was born, all the way to about 100 years after he was Simon crucified. Bar which that's Simon part of what I really enjoyed, if, by if, the way. If those guys the failed, way. then what did Jesus, you know, what's the right word to use for Jesus? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I, 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 mean think, I think those guys actually did fail. They were actual failed apocalyptic prophets. Jesus somehow managed, even after death, to, to get this movement going, to launch this movement from the very place he was buried and crucified and, and, um, and, and, and you know, well, yeah, obviously, yeah. In, in, in his tomb. And then that movement went on, as James said, to not only tur turn the Roman Empire upside down, but it's gone on to what Jesus taught the values that he brought to the world are what we swim in, and we don't even realize it. So in every way, like people in the West, whether they know it or not, they're really Christian. They just don't believe in the act. The, the, the yeah, doctrine. Speaking of people that are ostensibly Christians, <laughs> like Dale Allison, in his book he says that Jesus was wrong. When Jesus said the Son of Man will come in your lifetime, 
he was just as wrong as Joseph Smith predicting, you know, the temple would be built in Missouri. How do you disagree with Dale Allison? This is dealing with the Olivet Discourse, and, you know, Jesus says, as, as Mark 13 makes clear, uh, he, you know, the disciples are looking at the glory, and, and Josephus tells us about how the, when the sun would hit the temple, it would gleam like the gold, yeah. and just, you know, Her you know, King Herod, you know, made it so amazing. I can't imagine what it looked like. But Jesus said, you see that? You see that? You're impressed with that? Not one stone will be left on another. And he basically says, within a generation, and people like Dale Austin, everyone agrees, this is what Jesus was saying. Now, what happened within a generation? The temple was destroyed, and it hasn't been rebuilt since. And this is actually one of the arguments that the great early church father, John Chrysostom, makes. What Christ destroyed cannot be rebuilt. And he was talking about the temple. I like that. And what Christ like built that. cannot be destroyed, which is the church, and how it's gone on to conquer the world. But, so the question is, well, when you go back to those texts, though, it talks about how the Son of Man will come in the clouds, and, and, and you'll see the Son of Man in the, in the sign of the Son of Man in the sky. So my view of that is, and, and I'm following people like N.T. Wright and even his, his mentor, George Caird, and, and many who argued this, which is Jesus was an apocalyptic, he was in the line of an apocalyptic prophet. How beautiful is it that when God became a man, he not only became a Jew, but he became a Jew who was in the line of the prophets of old, you know, going all the way back to Abraham, to Isaiah, and the rest. That's who he, that, that he, he was... He was that, but he was more than that. But he, was, he wasn't less than that. And as an apocalyptic prophet, he was speaking, he was using this apocalyptic language when he was talking about this truly catastrophic, uh, into the world, in a sense, experience for Israel. And so AD 70 was this kind of end of the world change from Israel to go, you know, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, the way Paul talks about it. In Romans 9 through 11, this is a time when Israel is hardened, the gospel goes to the Gentiles, and then when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, there'll be another time for, for Israel again. But that initial prophecy of Jesus, if you just think of the historical Jesus, his prophecy was fulfilled. And you gotta, you got to give him some credit here. Imagine if someone today said, in 40 years, the White House is going down. Not one piece of wood will be left on that White House. And then 40 years later, it happened? You'd look back to that guy and go, whoa. We should maybe listen to other things he said. Well, here's my other problem. First of all, we don't know he said that. that well, and here's why they, but this is what's so cool to me, because this is how we get this as a, you know, in a sense, a bedrock. I mean, and you might have said it, but. Be because, here. because they think it's a failed prophecy, which I think they're wrong. Oh, I got you. Okay. So they, because yeah. they think it's a failed prophecy, that's why they think we can know Jesus said it. But what if Jesus said it, it was accurate. And he was using apocalyptic imagery, and so therefore he was not sure. he was not trying to say the world is going to end at this time. He was just using the same kind of apocalyptic imagery we find in the prophets. Because if you go back to the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, when they talk about Babylon coming in to destroy the temple in Jerusalem, they use the same kind of language. The stars are going to fall from the sky. Yahweh is going to come on clouds to destroy this place. So this is the same kind of language used in the Old Testament for a historical event. Now, now on, in addition to that, the, the, the gospel authors, I do think, believe that what Jesus said will be exhausted one day. So that language of the Son of Man coming in the clouds, will, well, like what happened to AD 70 is like a microcosm, is what, which is what's going to happen to the world one day. So if that's, if that's right, then Jesus was a 100% accurate apocalyptic. But here's the problem. The other part, Jesus is unknown and unknowable. And what the unknowable is, is we have so he much. He would be if we didn't have four Gospels. Like that matters. There's only, the Jesus seminar said only 23% of the sayings of Jesus go back to Jesus. And the book of John, it's all black. There's none of these things Jesus said. But why said do you behind. trust the Jesus seminar? Anyway. Here's the problem. It's like looking through a stained glass window, the, the Gospels. You have so much Christian tradition, Christian interpretation, and you know we use the criteria of dissimilarity. If it sounds too much like a Christian saying it, boy, it's out. And if you read Dale Allison's Jesus, the New Millenarian Prophet, mm -hmm. him and Crossan, when they're trying to figure out who Jesus is, they just argue on, did he say this? He might have said that. Mm -hmm. Probably said this. For instance, when take up your cross and follow me. Well, obviously Jesus didn't know how he was going to die, so that doesn't go back to Jesus. 
stuff mm -hmm. like giving to Caesars what it sees. Maybe that does. But you seem to think everything goes back to Jesus, which I find insane, <clears throat> to be honest. Well, <clears throat> I, I would say it this way. I would say there's what, what we call, which call it system of verba, the very words of Jesus that we have. And the voice I heard in, in, the, in the gospel. So we do have places where Jesus, we have the actual words. We have Abba. Sure. When Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said Abba. He said, Father, when he taught the disciples to pray, he taught them to say first, Abba. You know, he said, uh, Talithe kum, when he raised uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead. There, there's certain Aramaic words, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Sure. You know, my God, my God, he said that from the cross. So there's ipsissima verba. I don't think we have a lot of ipsissima verba. I think we have a little bit. We have mostly vox, which would be the voice of Jesus, which I think isn't giving us the actual, you know, if we had a recorder, it would, because already it's in translation, we're reading yeah. the Greek of Jesus when, when he spoke in Aramaic, so we're getting already a translation, and then I think we're also getting the theological interpretation of these gospel authors, which I think they are inspired by God, I do believe they're inspired by God, so they're giving us an accurate portrayal of what Jesus said, and in some, in some places, adapting it to their particular audience. So I'll give you an example. The sits and leave. <clears throat> yeah. When, when, uh, in Mark, Jesus says, if anyone who wants, if you uh, deny yourself, anyone who wants to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Luke, when he uses that, which scholars are pretty much in agreement, Luke used Mark, and, and I, I agree oh, with yeah, that. Yeah. So when Luke says that, he says, Jesus says, um, anyone who wants to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So, again, this would be a place where you could really separate the ipsissima of verba and the ipsissima of vox, because I think what Jesus actually said that day and meant was, if you're going to follow me, you, you better be ready to be crucified. And, in fact, some of his followers were crucified. We know Peter was crucified. So, th th this is literal. You're going to be crucified. Now, Luke, when he wrote to his audience, he was writing to a lot of people who probably maybe didn't face a situation like crucifixion, but they had to metaphorically, kind of like a Jordan Peterson <laughs> way that he said, you know, take up your cross and carry it up the hill, that you need to take up your cross daily and follow Jesus. And so I would say that's the vox, but it's true to the verba. And I think that's what we get in the Gospels. Mm. But you do realize that the Gospels are not history. They, the Gospel writers They're theological have, history. I would say they they're have theological, theological acts to grind. They're trying yeah. to oh. prove Jesus is God. So... But right there, I mean, you didn't have someone from the first Jerusalem Post recording events. We're having to go through things written 40 years later that are not the authors or the eyewitnesses of Jesus, and they have their theological agendas. And, and this is why scholars take it case by case and look at these things in a case by case basis. And I would and I would admit that there are some places that we you you can you can just take on faith because I I trust that the. Bible is inspired by God, that God has given it to us, and so I trust that it's there, even if I can't give evidence and prove to you and give you reasons to accept it, other than the fact that I believe that it's inspired. But then I would say there's a ton of sayings of Jesus, and a lot more than 18%, that we can, with good reason, show that the story of Jesus said this, whether it's Berber or Vox, we can trust what he said. Hmm. But obviously, in Mark, you have the Messianic secret. I hey, don't tell anybody who I am. Uh, let's keep this. You know, he says that in Mark. And then in John, all he does is talk about himself. I'm the way of the life. I'm the bread. I mean, it doesn't make sense that these. Well, but let's, let's, the audience, though, <laughs> and let's. And let's take that specific point. In John, though, he's not running around saying, I'm the Christ. So, so everywhere in the Gospels, Jesus is consistently not willing to say I'm the Christ, and the reason for that is because there was such a misunderstanding of who the Christ would be, and that he would mainly be, like those 14 other messianic pretenders, a political type fighter against Rome, and Jesus would, did not clearly did not come to do that. That was not his way. So, um, so, so yes, in John we get more of his outright claims about himself, like the I am statements and things like that, but also that those happen more in Jerusalem. John is giving more of Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. The Gospels are giving it more in Galilee, right. and so I think I think I think there's a lot of, of reasons why we can see, you know, again why, why the different Gospel authors are, are adapting to different audiences. But you take Mark. There's no, and a lot of Christians don't realize this: is there's no post-resurrection appearances. The women come to the tomb; they say nothing. You don't have the road to Emmaus. You don't have these uh, uh, the the cookout the, at the, uh, the Sea of Tiberias where you. you know, 
Gibbs fish to the. Yeah. Those are all legendary embellishments, wouldn't you say, of the later gospel writers? Matthew and Luke. <coughs> No, because I think they're based on eyewitness testimony. And then that's where it all comes down to. If these gospel authors are either know, know of many eyewitnesses or are eyewitnesses themselves, then I would say, even, even if you don't believe the Bible is inspired, if, if they're legitimate eyewitnesses that wrote within about 20 to 30 years of, it, of, it, of these events, and, and they were such extraordinary events as, as we know, you know they're, they're, they're being claimed to be, they would remember many things about these sure, events. They would remember. get a lot of these things right. And so, for example, uh, Luke 24, the, the road to Emmaus, you have the two disciples who say Jesus came and, and walked among them. And Luke tells us one of them, he just out of the blue says, one of them's named Cleopas. And so that, uh, Richard Bauckham makes the point in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, this is probably a sign, a tell, and we see this with other gospel writers, when they name someone like that, it's probably a way to say, hey, either the audience knew him, or they're saying, this is one of my eyewitnesses. As Luke mentions at the beginning of his gospel, I investigated these things from the beginning. <clears throat> I interviewed eyewitnesses. Cleopas is probably, and, and it's amazing. I mean, when you read that account as an eyewitness testimony, it's a vivid, beautiful story. And so you know, exact. I mean, it just reads like someone who's telling Luke the story, and he wrote it down. If you have a question, we want to give you an opportunity to, um, to to ask Justin a question about the book or about the discussion that we're having right now. If you'll go into the text here in Zoom and just uh, put the question, Daniel Ray is, is monitoring that, and he will uh, call you and ask you to unmute your mic. And I know uh, Phil has a question. Phil Bear has a question. And so uh, uh, let's just take a moment right now and let him, uh, Phil, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and, and ask your question of uh, Justin. Yeah, hi, Justin. It's great to have you. Um, you joined the conversation. Yes, um, I am I'm kind of working on um, a proposition. Uh, this is still under construction. Um, and and if you actually cover this in the book, I apologize because I haven't had a chance to finish it yet. Um, but I do have it and go through it. Um, so my, uh, my working proposition here is um, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, the best candidates for people who would have known that would be his disciples. Um, and especially Peter, um, you know, Peter and John. Um, so uh, I, I'm kind of formulating a little bit of an argument here that says if Jesus had not risen from the dead, his disciples would have known that he did not rise from the dead. But his disciples were convinced that he had risen from the dead because they were preaching to that effect, and they were even willing to die before they retracted their story. So if the disciples would have been, would have, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, his disciples would have known it, but they didn't know it because they believed he did rise from the dead. So it follows that Jesus rose from the dead. What do you, what do you think about that? that, that that's, I think it's really strong, and it's even an allusion to, I don't know if you've read Dostoevsky, you should read his uh, The Idiot. And The Idiot, I know it sounds, it sounds funny because it's called The Idiot, but <clears throat> it's actually brilliant. But in The Idiot, he makes kind of this point in, a, in telling the story about what happened to Jesus, he talks about this painting, and you actually can go online and, and look at this painting. I could send it afterwards to everybody. Um, I can't remember the name right now, but it's this painting of Jesus. It's the most horrific-looking Jesus you'll ever see. I mean, he's like got that green look, the greenish look of, of a person when they die, you know? He's got that, you know, post-mortis look, and he's, he's got this face like he's, he's like been screaming, and he makes the, the, the person in the story makes this point that, they must have seen Jesus like this. I mean, at least the women saw Jesus like this, Joseph of Arimathea. I mean, they had to have seen what this man looked like when he came off that cross, and it had to have been the most horrific. When, it, when a person was crucified, it was, was bad enough, but when they came off the cross, how horrible did it look? And so then what then would convince them <laughs> that this person is now Lord of the world if he did just stay like that, right? If he just, even if he, the body disappeared or something, they saw him. They saw how he looked, and so that, that horror of, that, of death and, and, and suffering and torture 
you know, what, what then convinced them that he's Lord of the world? It's that kind of argument. So I, I definitely think that's strong. And Here's a comment on that. John Dominic Cross and said, the people that knew didn't care. <laughs> you know, like the high priest and so <laughs> forth. They didn't care where the body was or that it was whatever. Uh, the people that knew didn't care. And the people that cared, the disciples, didn't know. Does he, that make he, sense? He would say the women went to the tomb, though. He would say the women knew at least that he, he was were at least at the cross, I would say. Well, that's I, one I need of to look the at that. feathers in the Christian apologetic you know, cat yeah. that uh, the women, but even that's kind of based on the, on the idea that it's impossible to be convinced <laughs> that something is true and, and then know that it's not true at the same time. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, well, well and, this, and, this, and this would be, I mean, and, and so I think if you had someone like Bart Ehrman here, he would say, he would say well, yes, they had experiences. And even Dell Allison, he would say, well, then they had experiences, of course. They had experiences. Well, then my next question would be, well, what was that, you know, what did they see? What, what, what happened then? You know, where, especially, and Dell Allison admits this, it's the unexpectedness of it for the first ones that's the toughest for the, for the historian to explain. Because it wasn't just that they believed that their, you know, leader was alive again in some way or was victorious in some way. It's specifically that he had raised from the, he was raised from the dead. They're, they're using that resurrection language that goes back to Daniel that they, the Jews believed would happen at the end of the world. They're saying, this man who was crucified rose again from the dead. The resurrection has begun in him. That demands explanation because, there, again, there's just no expectation for that at all. So even if you had experiences, some kind of bereavement thing where you really wanted him to be alive and, and, and then you conjured him up in your mind or something and then we're convinced that he's alive you wouldn't say resurrection you would say something like he was exalted to heaven he's still alive in some way he can still speak to me but it's that resurrection language that makes it just and, and the other, unparalleled the other strong, point, the other strong point here is that if they had some experience that led them to believe that jesus had risen from the dead they of all people were in a position to go and verify that experience they would have been able to go and check it out. They would have been able to go and find the body in the tomb, and they would have known that their experience uh, was misleading. But so, so they were, regardless of whatever experience they may even have had, they were in, in, the, in a position to be able to verify everything that they were, that they were claiming. And I don't, it, you know, it, I don't know that, um, that they would have just uh, been willy-nilly convinced by some kind of subjective experience and and not bother to go out and try to verify. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And and, and, you, and if you've been to Jerusalem, I don't know if, who's, you know, who, who here's been to Israel or been to Jerusalem. Dan's been there, been there. I mean, it's not that big. <laughs> I mean, today it's, you know, a lot of it's built up, like what, what Jesus and the disciples walked on is kind of a, a city below what the city is because cities just get built on each other from the ancient world but it's just not that big of an area i mean me and some guys when i was there the first time ran around it you know as, as like a morning jog and it's just not that you know you know the gospels talk about how john and peter raced <laughs> to the tomb it's just, it's just not that far i mean it's just it wouldn't have been that far to to run to to any of these places and so you know that's one of the things i mean it, it's it, this is what i think paul's point is when he says this didn't happen in a corner <laughs> This didn't happen in some secret place like the, you know, the, you know, Joseph Smith and his, uh, you know, what do they call golden something? Uh, you know, th th it didn't happen like that, you know. If, if I'm going to, if I'm going to die for something like that, I'm going to go back and double check. Yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure, I'm going to make sure that I'm not just going by some vague religious experience. You know, so experience argument, I don't think it works because those I mean, those guys were dead serious, and they were willing to die for what they were talking about. Yeah, I think the point, Phil, on that is th there are people that are willing to die for things that aren't true. We saw that on 9-11 with the terrorists. But I think your point is, and I would agree, that you don't, you're not willing to, you're, you're not willing to give your life for something you know is a lie. Uh, exactly. And so they would have had to have firsthand knowledge, and, and Paul's talking about an event that happened. Let, let me just let me just back up a second. So, 
You're saying, Justin, on these bedrock facts that even most skeptic and, and agnostic atheist scholars would agree. So I'll ask Bill. He'll he'll be our our test uh, atheist scholar. Uh, would you agree that it is a bedrock fact that there really was a historical Paul who made a radical life transformation, going from being an enemy of the early church to being its chief missionary, and that he claimed that he did see the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Would you agree that that's true? And would you agree that he really believed it? Or do you think that he said it, but he was lying? So, so Bill, what's your take on that? Uh, he, yes. Uh, and I, he, he, by the way, we have lots of historicists here. We do. We believe in Jesus. <laughs> um, and it's Amen. sad. You know, it's sad that, and I, I want to hear your opinion. These hip churches, we just went to one watermark where everybody's with their iPads and everybody's cool and they have their little community groups. But guess what? There's no Sunday schools anymore. There's no teaching of the word anymore. And you have these Christians in these cool hip churches that have mm -hmm. no clue uh, who Jesus is. They don't even have a clue what the Bible says. How do you respond to that? Well, I, th I think this is an epidemic. I think this is one of the reasons why the West, you know, the church in the West is plummeting across all lines and you know i think i think it's only maybe maybe, maybe evangelical whatever they categorize as evangelical churches hasn't been declining as much but the mainline denominations roman catholic all of the the are, are declining significantly and i think it's largely for this reason that you're not getting the hardcore teaching now i'll just say you know watermark actually is one of the few even you know it's a nice church and everything but you know you can call it a hip church but they actually do small groups do. and do and take that very seriously with discipleship, but they're one of the few. So, so mo most churches are just, you know, just a, an hour of entertainment, and you yes. go home, and there's no training, no discipleship, Amen. no hardcore, you know, Bible study, you know, theology, apologetics, church history. You know, to learn any of that, you really have to go out and study on your own, and that's cross denominations. That's not just Catholics. That's Baptists. That's that's you know, Presbyterians. That's people of all denominations. There's there's a remnant, I would say, of solid churches out yeah, there, yeah. but it's, it's a minority. minority. Yeah. And, and Bill, I'm confused. I'm confused a little bit on this. So, uh, too many Christians don't know enough information about Jesus. You're an atheist. Are you saying that's a good thing or a bad thing? Nobody should know about Jesus and about Paul. Yeah, and to conclude about Paul, Paul. I believe, yeah, he saw something, and he did have a radical change in his life. But remember, Paul was a tightly wound, very idiosyncratic sort of guy who, who you know, you've met these people that go one way, the other way, and then once they change, they go completely, mm -hmm. they're all in, no matter what. So I'm just thinking Paul's not our, from a psychological, and you read Romans 7, where <laughs> you see this repressed homosexual who hates himself, who just has all these mixed feelings. I don't see, I don't oh, see John it. Shelby Spall. I don't see him. What version of the Bible? But what, <laughs> no, John Shelby Spall. But what did, this I'm, I'm challenging that as a bedrock fact. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a bedrock fact? No, it, it, it's, it's a minority view. You're but right. What, but what, what did Paul believe he saw? There isn't Jesus. But, and, and you would say he was, so you're saying he was wrong, but in what in what sense he was lying? Who knows? Yeah, I mean, it's just what I'm saying. It's not our most. You do agree that Paul was, you know, kind of a complex, tightly wound, all in sort of guy. He was an alpha dog, male that, yeah, there you that go. took the gospel to the ends of the earth and was and on really, fire, and was a man that that wept over his churches. Mm -hmm. The man that wrote First Corinthians 13, that tons of unbelievers will have read at their weddings. Sure. You know, said said some of the most beautiful things about love and about you know so many other things. Um, and basically the co-founder he, he was willing to be stoned you know be oh, actually absolutely. stoned to death and then get back up and go and yeah kept I like going. that part of your book where he said he came back yeah. to the city yeah. and but and you could say so so, so you so you you at least agree he's sincere yeah. you're just saying you think there's something wrong in his brain well <laughs> Paul's a complex figure and he's really <laughs> the co-founder of Christianity and it's hard to imagine if we didn't have Paul Paul was never born a lot of scholars say it would have been a small Jewish sect because the genius of Paul was, hey, you guys can eat pork sandwiches and that circumcision thing, just forget it. Who, who was Paul writing to when he wrote Romans? The Roman church, the Christians. Of the but, but how did they get there? Yeah, one, so one Paul. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, well, obviously. Okay. Yeah, yeah where, did the, where did the Alexandrian church come from? Yeah, no, there's one Paul. But what do you think of the, yeah. So, 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 I, so I, I think what we only emphasize Paul 
and I think rightly because we have all this information about him because yeah. Luke, who was his buddy, tells us about him mainly through Acts. But there were Christians all over the Roman Empire spreading the gospel, Absolutely. proclaiming it. And even if there wasn't a Paul, that it still would have gotten, what do you got, think, become the largest religion Mentioning in the world. that, you know, from 30 to 50, we just don't have any writings till Paul comes along. What mm. do you think of that tunnel vision? What's it called? The tunnel period in Christianity? Where they're, too bu they're busy. They're, they're getting after it. They're busy about the kingdom. Michael, if you want to open your um, unmute, and you were in line for a question, a question chat in the chat. Yeah, uh, a lot of things I could say, some of which not very good, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I had a couple of comments, um, uh, a couple different things. Uh, James Walker, so what's in it for you? Because there's got to be a compelling reason that the disciples who evidently knew it wasn't true, well, so what, I mean, there's got to be something in it for these guys, because unless they were crazy, so they, you know, I can understand. I, I, how much you make a lot of money, James? I bet you don't. Yeah. So, so I think rich and famous. Rich and famous. Uh, yeah, I, you know, and I can certainly understand a person wanting to have a TV network and lots of money. Okay, but you know, the apostles there. I don't think things went so well. It wasn't a lot of health and wealth there. You know, being asked to be crucified upside down, that's worse than watching a certain team that plays in Arlington. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little glib here, but the point is, uh, look, these guys, if, if they, unless they were insane, believed it really happened, and that's what everybody accepts. But there's a deeper problem here, and I think I hear some of the, the sweet folks here who, you know, trying to do the best they can with these, you know, very compelling bedrock arguments with which I'm afraid Brother Bart Ehrman is sharing too. Uh, these bedrock arguments only matter if you have a Christ, if you have a monotheistic worldview. See, worldview dictates what you can accept. If you're if you have a prior commitment to um, atheism, well, then you're going to have to come up with tightly wound, you know, that Paul's a tightly wound, tightly tightly wound, messed up guy. You know, I'm pretty tightly wound. But I'd like to think that it doesn't preclude me from making good comments about my field as a professional musician and professional music teacher. I'd like to think that it, it doesn't preclude me from making reasonable decisions about matters on who God is and, you know, uh, and whatnot. I'm not sure tightly wound is a compelling reason to discount somebody's beliefs. Oh. And so that's great. Not great. And, and yeah. You know what I'm trying to say? And just, and just, so, you know, and so let me just wrap up here. I'm pontificating, which, uh, you know, that's my former occupation as a professor. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, w w the point is worldview dictates how you look at these things. It's kind of like you have to be an evolutionist, more or less, if you're an atheist, because it's as one person said, it's the only game in town. Um, but here's the thing. When you hear Christians, and I heard, you know, I go to Sunday school at use the professor there was like oh every and you hear this sure, christian, 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 christian died, died a martyr's death. Martyr's death. we do not we do not i don't think the bloodbath that occurred in in uh, circus maximus and other kinds of places i mean people were killed i mean we have all these records i guess you could assume if you don't want to believe that all these people that but, but it's still but it begs the question though if you don't believe god exists you can't accept it all anyway so you're gonna have to go, go through gyrations to deny stuff right isn't that really true it can't be can't be indeed a moss who's a catholic who really isn't a christian wrote a book who's and what she says is the book's called the myth of persecution you've read it have yes. what do you think of that that the christians have really overblown this thing I, I would say she's kind of a Bart Ehrman version of this. So she, she, there are some bedrock facts about persecution and, and martyrs yeah. of the faith that she would even agree on. But her book is, I would say, on the extreme side of being, being skeptical on some of these things. But when it comes to the key ones, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, Paul, those are three that Bart Ehrman, that across the board, they would agree, you know, people agree. Not only do we know that they believe Jesus appeared to them, but they died. They died for their faith. Uh, well, Peter, when you get Peter, to and Paul, Peter and Paul under yeah. Nero, yeah. James, you know, James we know about because yeah. of Josephus. Josephus. And he was stoned. Yeah. 
because there was this competition between. But when you get to Andrew, like St. Andrew's Cross, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> when it comes when it comes to the other apostles, when it comes to the other apostles, I would say, I have no doubt they took the gospel as far as they could go. Were all of them martyred? I don't know. And I think a lot of the stories that come later, we can't, you know, authenticate because they're just so much later. But I would say, you know, Peter, James, and and, and Paul are are strong. We know pretty much what happened to John because he lived the longest. He was all the way into the early second century. Um, I think just a second. I think I think I think, I think, uh, I think um, Pete had, Pete another, had question. another question. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it does. I have a comment actually. It does seem to me though that worldview dictates how you look at these things, because if you if you have a prior commitment to atheism. It doesn't really matter. It's got to be something funny. You can you can go all day long with all these I think compelling arguments, but if you have a prior commitment to no miraculous things happening, you're not going to have a miraculous thing. You're gonna you're gonna fall back on forgive me for teasing you, but uh, wacko ideas about being tightly wound. I, I I mean I agree with that. I would just say I would just say I agree with you in general, uh, but I would say Paul himself. It was not in his worldview that Jesus rose from the dead, and uh, and so and so and so I would say Jesus, the risen Christ, can invade anyone's false worldview, and so so that's that's my hope in proclaiming these great truths. I think ultimately God has to open the open people's eyes, but he but but just because you have a certain worldview, whatever it is, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, Jesus can come in and open your eyes to the real. The real truth into the into the real thing. So Paul and, and I'm in the Christian camp, right? But I gotta tell you that when I read Paul and then when I read Jesus, I struggle to reconcile those a bit. They I mean they're almost like kind of slightly different faiths. We have two different gospels. Jesus had a gospel of yeah. works. You know, you saw me hungry, you saw me in jail works. Uh rich man, what should I do? Oh, go and uh, you know, obey the law and all. And Paul, you're saved by grace plus nothing. Well, but let me answer this well, anti-supernatural bias I'm being accused of. Go ahead. Well, I just want to wrap that up by saying I don't think they're at odds with each other. I'm just saying that I do have to sure. struggle a bit to harmonize. And, that's, that, that and this, awesome. is, this is part of, you know, it's a great field in New Testament scholarship of, of seeing how, the, like the theology of John, the theology of the synoptics, the theology of Paul, the theology of Hebrews, you know, putting them together is, but I, I do think they're har harmonious, and I think you just have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think each of them are emphasizing different things because of their different audiences, but ultimately they're coming to the same conclusion, especially on the essentials. On the, I, I think James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul probably did have a little bit different view on yeah. how the Gentiles, right. you know, would would follow the law of Moses. That's but on essentials, there are an agreement, which makes it more credible, more historical. And by the way, let me just answer this question real quick. I don't go through a, with an anti-supernatural bias. I look at the facts, and let me give you an example. Jesus walking on water. I read Mark, and it seems to be bare bones. It seems to be believable. But then I read Matthew, and Matthew has a different story. He has Peter walking on the water. Now, Peter goes and fails, and uh, Jesus rescues him and so forth. So you have two different accounts, not necessarily contradictory, but when I look at it personally, I, I'm trying to figure out, is this historical or not? And what do you think, Justin? I mean, you have two different mm -hmm. accounts. On the, on the walking on water? Yes. One we, we Peter, have three. We have which three. are millions. Oh, three, okay. Yeah, yeah, three of the Gospels that tell this story, which is incredible because Luke, who had Mark, knew this story, and he didn't include it in his Gospel. So it's kind of an amazing thing that you know, it shows you that they just had this embarrassment of riches they had so much that even Jesus walking on water wasn't <laughs> didn't, didn't make the cut. Uh, but, but yeah, so we have it in Mark, we have it in um, Matthew. In, Ma in Matthew, and we have it in John. So uh, in Mark, I would say we're getting. I think we can. I think we can demonstrate through through many other arguments that we're getting the eyewitness testimony of Peter <clears throat> of this experience. And so and so I think maybe it's Peter's humility of why he doesn't tell the you know story about how he was. Oh, know, yeah, walking on water a little bit yeah. and having that experience. So, so yeah, I think, you know, again, it goes back to do you trust these people like Peter, who's behind the Gospel of Mark, and I think we have good reasons to trust Peter that he's telling us the truth of these experiences. Uh, but, but you said you're, you you don't have anti supernatural bias. Just curious, what what's happened supernatural in the world? Uh, I don't know. We had a guy that uh, wrote a book on miracles, and I've experienced a miracle 
uh, someone miraculously healed. So, you know, well, I'm, a, I'm a lot more open than most, um, you know, atheists. But you, you just. And how do you think that was healed? Man, I don't know. We asked the doctor. You know, I was a Christian then. And I said, well, what do you think of that? You know, broken collarbone healed in two days. And he goes, <laughs> she's a miraculous healer. So you never know. I mean. Uh, do you think, but, you think God did it? Who knows? Um, but I do read the great Germans. And what do you think of this? The demythologizers, as you know, mm -hmm. looked at the miracles and they just threw, you know, just threw them out. They pretty clearly had an anti-supernatural bias. Oh, of course. You say, okay. Well, and, and even, you know, and, and in a way, right. to, to defend them a little bit, people like Rudolf Boltmann, he was actually trying to save Christianity oh. for the new modern world. So that's why he was demythologizing you know, demythologizing a lot of it. He thought that was the better thing. Just we just need to have this existential experience with Jesus, and you know, whatever what ap what actually happened in history doesn't really matter. But of course, that didn't work out so well. Uh, that that's not that's not. I wouldn't say that's the way to go. I would say the way the Gospels had been read for the first eighteen hundred years, albeit some other mistaken things, is the way to go. I think I think trusting that they are the Word of God. Well. Don't short you, you, you said something beyond nature. Healed. Is this healed. Healed. Welcome to agnosticism. Um, so there's a, a couple of things. Um, I want to back up just a little bit yeah. with Paul and uh, Luke, or Paul and Luke. Um, I, I know you've heard, and I'm sure you have a, an opinion about the idea of um, Paul quoting Luke in 1 Timothy 5.18. Yeah. Uh, a laborer is worthy of his wages which would put Luke in the Gospels potentially in the 50s or, you know, if, if that's quoting Scripture. Um, some people would say that, you know, that being that a pastoral epistle, Paul didn't write that, it was later. Yeah. And, and so they're, they can put Luke in, you know, post-70 or whatever. What do you think of that? And then the second, second point, I think we have some questions in the chat about um, martyrdom. And we're not, we're not making the argument that because the disciples were martyred or were willing to die, that this proves Christianity. This, just, <coughs> this, this is an argument that just says they're probably they were not lying. It proves they were sincere. Yeah. Okay. What do you think about the uh, Timothy reference? Yeah, so, so, so to me, that, that quotation from Luke and Timothy fits with my dating for other reasons of the synoptics because I think, I mean, I, I don't see how when you study Luke and Acts, the way Acts is leading towards Paul's trial ultimately not, doesn't tell us what happened. I think that that is, and there, there's actually some liberal scholars that Adolf von Harnack and others that were agreement agreed on this and even changed their minds on this. That it puts Luke and Acts in the 61 to 62 time frame. Uh, if Luke used Mark, that would put Mark probably late 50s or as as you know possibly you know 60, 59 somewhere. Interestingly, Luke and Mark are hanging out with Paul. We know from Paul's letters. Uh, he mentions him in the greetings. So I would say uh, 1 Timothy is written somewhere around 64 AD, quoting Luke. That was written around 61, 62. And so it fits with Paul hanging out with Luke. He probably had that gospel. Uh, and that might even be what he's referring to when he says, hey, you know, when you come, come and see me, bring a cloak and bring the parchments. You know, bring, the, bring the scrolls, especially the parchments. You know, he, wants the, he wants the stories of Jesus. How do you establish something in ancient history was actually a good historical fact is the whole thing so just uh, i think yeah, you're talking yeah. about the wish list the wish list of uh what scholars would oh, like oh, to oh, say yeah that's right yeah. yeah uh i i referenced i referenced bart ehrman's wish list in his books he talks about a okay. wish list for historians that okay. might be and maybe that is for yeah I don't, and they I, said, hey, you got that. So uh, I, I, I did that, though, just to show that, yeah, to show how he was putting the bar so high. Because I wanted to say there are so many things in history that so many, you know, classicists, you know, certain historians of, of different areas, you know, many different, different areas, whether it's Greek philosophy, you know, uh, Roman history, that they don't have anywhere near that wish list. Mm -hmm. And they accept these things as, yeah. as historical. So people really do accept things. Um, you know, like, like for example, Tacitus. I think we have, you know, for Tacitus and his writings, which is the main basis for a ton of things about like the the, uh, the, the Roman Caesars um, <coughs> and certain uh, aspects of Roman history. From uh, Tacitus's uh, writings, we have I think it's just two manuscripts mm. that survive, and those manuscripts are like 
700, 800, something like, you know, close to eight centuries after when Tacitus wrote right. that we have the manuscript, but <laughs> Tacitian scholars trust yeah. trust that that's, you know, they don't they don't write books called misquoting Tacitus. You know, they, they trust that, you know, <laughs> that they trust that Tacitus, you know, in those manuscripts were, get, were given what Tacitus wrote, and we can trust, you know, not everything, but we can trust a lot of what Tacitus wrote. Same thing, Josephus, you could do the same thing. But yeah, I, but, 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 but and, then, and then I showed that when it comes to that wish list, almost all of it, I think the only thing that, that he put in there that doesn't really pass, uh, like 1 Corinthians 15 that I talk about as our bedrock, bedrock source for these uh, claims about the resurrection is the unbiased. You know, he, he says, you know, we want unbiased sources. Well, <laughs> how many unbiased sources do we have about certain things in history? Almost everybody who wrote anything about something in the ancient world had a bias about that, right? Uh, but, but, but that doesn't take away the reliability of it. So even with his high bar, which if you stuck to that, you would have to throw away almost 80, 90% of, of ancient history. Even with that high bar, though, just about uh, all of the things that I talked about in the book, uh, Paul's letters and things, um, and, and the early creeds written in, uh, within them pass that, th those high bars. Uh, so so that, that's why I was confused for a second, because I don't personally have that for, for, for thing, but I was using that to just show how solid the um, the uh, Paul's letters and the creeds written within them. Just reinforce what uh, somebody else was saying that you know worldview affects how you're approaching things and I think in uh, some of these things it says we throw out this word or this this act of Jesus because we don't believe in the supernatural they may not state it like that but that's kind of their <clears throat> criteria for what happened or what didn't it seems like now I have not read all these people so I don't know if that's how, what percentage of that's true, but I think I get the impression, I, I won't say feeling, an impression sounds much more scholarly, right, than feeling. I think it's deeper than that. I think, I think, uh, I think that's a part of it, and a lot of times that's what they, you know, someone like Bart Ehrman would admit that, that, you know, a historian can't discover. They can't know about a miracle or a supernatural event. That's just not his definition of a historian, which I completely do disagree with. I think a historian is someone who studies what happens in history, and if a miracle happened in history, you know, so. we should yeah. be, if we have the evidence, we can know that it did happen. Uh, but, but I would say, you know, I do think Romans 1, John 3, you know, that men suppress the truth in their unrighteousness, that, you know, men love darkness rather than light. So I do think there's a deeper reason, ultimately, why not everyone, mm -hmm. uh, but, but because I think people can be on the path towards... Uh, becoming a Christian, and maybe they are cautiously agnostic initially, but eventually they're being wooed and they're open and they're humble and they're accepting it. But I think ultimately people who, who reject things that are clearly brought before them, I think it's for other reasons. I think it's for moral reasons or well, we were talking hate, hatred of God. Or remember something. we were talking about the feeding of the 5,000. Oh, is it 4,000 before you got here? And I just look at what the Bible says, okay? I'm not trying to have any bias. I'm just trying to fairly look at it when it says 4,000 and then two chapters later it says 5,000 and here's the key. There are two different events. <laughs> That's yeah. what he was saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. What happens is they go, how are we going to feed all these people? Wow, you, we just read 5,000 when you look at things and like Jesus that. Jesus says, don't you remember when we, yeah. I mean Oh, I know. So, so assumes, why would, assumes, would, need, why would the disciples yeah. even ask the questions? And what the it's scholarly view is. Well, you, you assume that, I think one thing is you assume that my view on that is that, you know, it's a three and a half year ministry. If this had happened, you know, a year, a year and a half, or, you know, two years before, and imagine if you really did live with Jesus for, you know, you're going around with Jesus and he's healing people and he's casting out demons and those amazing, extraordinary things are happening almost on a daily basis, you might forget something like the feeding of the, the 5,000 back then, and then now... It's mm -hmm. happening again in a different context, and you, you know, for a moment, they don't really know what's going on, and then Jesus has to remind them. Are you well, so, do you not remember? Maybe, but what I've read is he just had two traditions, uh, and he just crammed them both in. Let's take a couple examples. The birth narrative. There's no birth narrative in Mark. Right. And then what we do have is two contradictory birth accounts. In Matthew, he goes to Egypt, he had the slaughter of the innocents. Luke, you got this fake census that you go to somebody's house that's a hunt, 
thousand years earlier. And then the trial has all sorts of problems that are unhistorical. And even Pilate at the crucifixion, you know, would never have let someone off that was a... So there's so much fiction in Christian... He didn't let him off. He didn't let him off. Yeah. He let the... <coughs> the guy off the, oh, perhaps. One thing I like to address is that you brought up several times because one gospel has something, the other lets it out, and it's like you're trying to make something of that. And it's it's really kind of a logical fallacy, I think, to say if something is not mentioned that it didn't exist. No, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. But so, what is the but that, that's kind of your, your implication in a few things. Well, I'll give you one thing, and I hate to bring this up. It's a really low blow, but okay. we did it to everybody know. else, so... Uh, the zombies in Matthew. Okay. You know, you know, I'm going there. And and what Mike Lacona? Okay, thanks. You're Mike, right. it was so problematic that Mike Lacona was fired because he said, "I I don't really believe in those zombies." I got to be yeah. honest. What do you think? Yeah, I, I actually talked about it in my first book. My first book was based on my dissertation, which was on the, the descent of Christ into the underworld. And so I deal with that passage because I do think a part of the the imagery in that in that account is is possible that it's. Uh, alluding to that, dis, you know, Jesus basically shooting up souls into some of the, you know, kind of a kind of a appetizer City for Jerusalem. the ultimate yeah. Yeah. resurrection. Right. But, yeah. but ultimately, that that Jesus is, you know, descended into the other world and he released the captives who were in Abraham's bosom, and so some of them are already, you know, coming back into their bodies and rising again. Uh, in the in the book, I talk about how it, you know, I, I think I think uh, Lacona's position is is definitely possible. It could be a, a, a apocalyptic. Uh, imagery to teach a point like a parable you know but you know doing that too much you can get into slippery slopes but I do take it out I think Matthew I think Dale Allison's right here he doesn't believe it happened but he agrees that Matthew thought it happened and I think Matthew thought it happened and I think it did happen <laughs> because I think Matthew is telling the truth oh, you think so, it happened? yeah so so I think so I think so I think these guys did so, so I parallel it to um, in the Old Testament if you remember uh, the prophet Elisha when he died he was buried. His bones were put in this uh, burial spot, and these two guys were um, uh, fighting. There was, there was like a battle nearby, and one of the guys gets killed, and he falls into the into the burial spot where Elisha's bones are. He touches Elisha's bones and pops right back up and comes to life. So I think, you know, did that happen historically? Well, again, you know, can I prove that? No, I, I think it's because I trust the Book of Kings and the off the prophets who wrote Kings, and it's a, a part of the scriptures. It's a part of the canonical Bible. So, so, so I think it's, it's inspired. So I do think that that story really happened. And then I think the what when Jesus dies, not only one person comes back, but multiple people. And it's old. See, here's the problem. Hey, wait, hold, hey, Bill, can I throw this out to you? So six weeks before, I'm sorry, six weeks before Jesus dies on the cross and rises from the dead, he does what? He raises Lazarus from sure. the dead. What were they wanting to do to Lazarus because Jesus had raised him from the dead? They wanted to kill him. So, it to me it makes perfect sense why they why Christians wouldn't want to talk about all these people who had come to life at the crucifixion of Christ, however many there were. Why would you Why would you want to put your your buddy in danger? Why would you want to put another person in danger when you know the Jews already want to kill Lazarus because of what happened to, uh, with Jesus raising him from the dead? Here's the problem: What's we the do problem? not have someone from the Jerusalem Post interviewing those zombies. We just are taking Matthew's word, and that might have happened. And, and, and this is yeah. like no, I said, this isn't either. something. This isn't something we can prove. This isn't something we can really demonstrate with evidence beyond what we have in Matthew, because we only have it in Matthew. But that's the thing. You, you, it's but it in no way affects whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. So that's where you need to focus. Well, here's where did Jesus rise from the dead? Here's an answer. You don't need to worry about the zombie apocalypse. You need to worry about what you Jesus have rose from a. The dead. If he rose from the dead. That there's, there's some. You have a big him. emphasis on Paul, which. Is, is, well, uh, but just know, just so you know, it's not that I think Paul is more important than the gospel. No, of course. I only yeah. emphasize Paul because that's the bedrock, common Early. ground that everyone okay. agrees. Here's on. So I'm, I'm, a I'm, question I've just remembered. Focus you say Paul says, and this is crucial, mm -hmm. that he appeared to 500, some of whom are still alive. Uh -huh. So, and wow, and 500 and witnesses, that would be great. We cannot interview them. We do not know but Paul their stories. Did. But Paul did, and you've already agreed. Paul was trustworthy. Paul did, and he says that they, the majority of those 500 were alive. He interviewed them, and they are readily available to, to testify that Jesus, that they saw Jesus to the Corinthians who wanted to, to, to take a holiday 
and go and visit, not not go to Disneyland. You don't want to go to Disney World anymore. It's a terrible place. You want you want to go to you want to you, you, you want to go to Jerusalem so you can interview some of these 250 plus that people who saw Jesus. So 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 even though you can't and the Jerusalem Post can't, if you trust Paul through Paul, you have these trustworthy witnesses. That's the bottom line. You've already said Paul is trustworthy, and he might be. But then, then why don't you trust be, him on this? Well, not because I don't hear Matthew saying it. I don't hear a church father, Justin Warner. You just or, need, but you just need, if, if one trustworthy person says, Josephus is our only eyewitness to the, the Jerusalem temple mm-hmm. being destroyed. And you trust him on probably not everything, some of the things he exaggerated. But he's not tightly wound like Paul. <laughs> no, 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 we, we didn't know him. We, didn't know. we do have a question from uh, Phil. <laughs> and you learned at one point by the same point that if somebody doesn't mention it, it didn't happen. Yeah, and and, and, and you know, Bill, just 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 to follow up with what you said there, as far as as far as Justin, you can correct me because you know more about the ancient history than I do. But where are the people from the Mediterranean post who would have been reporting on the eruption of Vesuvius in 70 A.D.? There's one. Only one surviving extant written account from Pliny the Younger about that volcanic eruption, which would have been, you would think, far more dramatic to people in the ancient world at that time than an itinerant Jewish guy walking around or a couple of dead guys walking around Jerusalem. Would you think? Where are all those reporters? Mm-hmm. Where are they? Yeah, you got a point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, 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 and on the 500, just so you know, Dal Allison, you should talk to him about that when, when you all talk to him because he does agree that Paul's reliable. There were, there were, you know, he agrees, you know, and I agree that he it's, it's in the 500. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. I, I just, in fact, uh, watch my, uh, watch my discussion with him on Unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> we talk about it. Uh, Justin, I've been uh, reading quite a bit about historical skepticism recently, and I've been reading a lot from William and Craig and people like that who have some comments to make philosophically about histori- about historiography, and. So my question is, um, in your book, you're pretty much laying out evidence that there are certain core, uh, certain core claims that everybody agrees on. And my question is, do you think there is such a thing as an indisputable historical fact? Well, uh, I mean, if if you if you if if we wanted to define indisputable, you 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 want to say like meaning a hundred percent, meaning they're they're you can't find anyone disputing even in the comment section of YouTube, like that kind of indisputable. <laughs> like, like, like even even on the Zeitgeist common, you know, the comment section of the Zeitgeist video, even they would agree. Like that kind of indisputable. Um, when I say indisputable, I'm not talking about whether or not anyone disagrees with it. Um, okay. I'm talking about where the evidence is so. Uh, is so satisfactory that that no uh, yeah. yes. that, that really no reasonable person would even think about that. So so then you know so this would be a little subjective, of course, because right you know we would say I would say that you know mythicists and who have actually studied this are unreasonable in concluding that Jesus did not exist based on the evidence. But let, let's 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 do something that I think everyone who would watch this would agree with, like the Holocaust. Did the Holocaust happen? Right? You know, we I think we would all, everyone would agree, mythicists, everyone who studies any of these things would agree that there was a Holocaust, six million plus Jews were murdered, you know, um, but there are still people, even with degrees, who write books denying the Holocaust. You know, you, you even have people on Twitter from Iran, Ayatollahs. Uh, tweeting and uh, and they deny the Holocaust. So so we would say they are completely unreasonable about this indisputable fact. But I would but I would say and, and I, I I mean so it depends on how you want to define the indisputable fact, right? And 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 for me, a helpful way to define it would be when all the experts from all different walks of life, from all different you know mindsets, religions, when they all agree on something. Who have credentials in the, these areas? To me, that would be, a, a you know, a definition of an indisputable fact. Yeah, that's as close as you can get. So there'd still be someone, you know, maybe that has a PhD that has a blog, you know, uh, <clears throat> Richard Carey, you know, someone like that that would, you know, dispute this. But still, you know, it would be an indisputable fact, even though you have some of those outliers.
Yeah, and part, part of the reason for my question is you claim that the that the evidence for Jesus and for the resurrection and all these claims is 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 insufficient. Um, yet they accept all sorts of historical data and historical claims that have far less evidence than what we have mm -hmm. in terms of Jesus and for the resurrection. And I mean, uh, I've asked people if they if they doubt that we can know that, that Socrates existed and that we can know anything about his life. And, and if I remember correctly, I don't know whether this is Socrates or somebody else, but I think you only have pretty much one source for Socrates. And, <laughs> and if that's the case, then um, if everyone accepts the claims that Socrates existed and what he taught, that we can have, a, you know, we can have an accurate idea of what he taught, um, on on much less evidence than what what we have for Christ and for the Gospels. And, and the yeah, I would just say uh, we do have we actually have three solid sources for Socrates uh, that were his disciples. So I actually in my book parallel Socrates to Jesus a little bit because it's a good example of where you have biased sources, disciples written probably within about twenty to thirty years of. Of Socrates and I would say same with Jesus and then you have scholars going back saying okay what can we know about the historical Socrates you know what which what is Plato here and what is Socrates here uh, and so so to me again against the myth this this is you know very strong against because it, it shows you you know what can you know what what inspired Plato and Xenophon there was a historical Socrates I would say it's impossible it, it's possible to sort out the myth from the history, even if you're relying on biosources. sources. I have another question, and this really disturbs because I believe in the death and crucifixion of Jesus. But what disturbs me, Justin, is there's a billion Muslims that don't believe he was crucified. What do you say to that? Yeah. Yeah. Again, <clears throat> that would be an example where uh, your faith is usurping your trusting of history. So, so they, and, and what's interesting about this, and I brought this up <coughs> when Dale, uh, Dale Allison and I had our discussion on unbelief, Justin Breyer was unbelievable. Uh, Reza Aslan, actually, uh, you might have heard of him. He was on CNN. He's the guy that, that ate the brains and got fired from CNN. But um, he, 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 he's not a great scholar, but he actually is a Muslim. He's a self-proclaimed Muslim who delved into historical Jesus studies, wrote a book called Zealot. And in that book, he says, well, the fact that Jesus was crucified can't be denied. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so, so Reza Aslan, apparently, you know, crucifixion is such a bedrock fact that usurps the Quran. But for most, especially passionate Muslims who believe the Quran is the word of God, you're going to, I don't care how many <laughs> citations you have from the ancient world that Jesus was crucified, they're going to trust the Quran over over uh, actual history. So I would just say they're not doing history. They're clearly just doing their faith. They're doing yeah. their theology based on the Quran. But this would be, I think, an evidence that the Quran is absolutely incorrect. Yeah. In fact, it's, it, the, 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 the surah that, that is saying this is actually based on a Gnostic text that goes back to the, the second century that Irenaeus, the, the church father, quotes, <laughs> which actually says that Jesus wasn't crucified, actually... Uh, in, in that text, it was Simon uh, who carried the cross. He he was crucified in Jesus' place, and Jesus was like hovering over him, laughing at him. So that was in the Gnostic um, story, and so Muhammad probably got that, just like he got the story about Jesus, you know, um, making clay. He he, he he speaks while he's in the womb. I mean, not the womb. He speaks while he's in the crib. He, he uh, makes a bird out of clay. These stories all come from apocryphal gospels from the second and third century, which probably made their way to Arabia <coughs> through certain uh, Christians and tradesmen. And that's what ended up making it into the Quran. Phil, did you have another question? Yeah, just real, uh, actually just kind of a quick one. Um, uh, is, is, it, is it a generally accepted principle of historiography that if a secular source contradicts the Bible, that the secular source must be accurate and the Bible must be incorrect. 
I, I, I would say, you know, to be fair, it would depend on the scholar. You know, for some, you know, they, they, it seems like the secular sources always are given credence over the biblical text. Uh, Josephus must be right here, not the biblical text. But, but you know, in, in even liberal scholarship that I've read, many times they'll say, oh, you know, I think the Bible, you know, Luke is right here and, and Josephus is wrong here. So, you know, I think it would, it would be a scholar by scholar comparison. But, but I think generally on the more liberal scholarship, they would trust uh, a secular source over the biblical source just because they are automatically assuming that the Bible is you know, written by biased people. And so, you know, I'm going to trust the person outside over what the Bible is telling me. The wish list that Bart Ehrman lays out for historians includes that the sources would be unbiased, <laughs> which, like I said, is like, you know, this is this would be. I, I don't I don't know if any sources that are unbiased except things that you find incidentally somewhere else that has no you know where the person has no interest in the thing he's talking about. And he just on by you know in a passing reference refers to it. That would be the an example of an unbiased source. Well, we do have Caesar right. crossing the Rubicon, which we do have hostile sources, <laughs> and history wouldn't have played out the way it did unless it actually happened. So, And we have, for Caesar Augustus, we have coins of him, in which you mentioned in the book. We have hard evidence. With Jesus, it's, the evidence is so bad and so contradictory and so inconsistent. I don't know. What, without, what? without Jesus, though, we wouldn't have this religion called Christianity that's been going on for 2,000 years and it's the largest. So I think that beats the Rubicon. Justin, kind of off topic, uh, there's been some new, well, not new, but more recent interest in the Shroud of Turin. Do you have any, what's your opinion on that at all? You know, I, mean, I, I know you're an expert, but... I, yeah, I need to get into that and study that more. But the little I looked into it, it does just seem like a Middle Ages forgery. But you know, I'm the one thing that fascinates me about it is because we have, of course, in John that when Jesus left the tomb empty, his his uh, <coughs> covering was folded up. It was nicely folded up, <coughs> and I just can't imagine that the earliest followers didn't keep that because that was the one thing that they could have kept, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that would have been Jesus's. Everything else, you know, what yeah. else of Jesus's existed? That was the only thing they could have kept. So now how long were they able to keep it? And, and, and the thing that, again, makes me think that it's a forgery is because, you know, I've been reading the Church Fathers chronologically for years, and my goal is to read through all of them. <clears throat> and at least up through the 5th century, it's never mentioned. So you'd think somebody, I mean, if, if anybody had that and, and could even use it and say, hey, this is something from yeah. the tomb of Jesus. You know, it'd be one of the popes. It'd be one of you know Augustine would have got his hands on. It. I mean, somebody would have gotten their hands on. And there would have been a historical years. historical chain of custody that somebody so, would have, like the Ark or something. Exactly. So, so yeah. the absence. I mean, again, doesn't disprove it, and it and it could be. And it'd be amazing. It'd be physical evidence of the resurrection. But um, yeah, if I had to, if I had to bet, I would bet it's a forgery. Gotcha. Huh. But it's amazing. It's an incredible thing. It, I mean, if it is a forgery, it's phenomenally. I was listening to Gary Habermas uh, give his point of view on it. He says, "Just ask me on a particular day, and I'll change my mind." <laughs> yeah. But uh, but you know the details about how the, uh, the 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 wounds and everything. Um, I think one scholar was going into about how it looked like X-ray, like light coming out from the outside, and nobody really knows how they could forge it. So it, it is fascinating. I don't. I don't. I haven't looked it into it long <clears throat> enough to know that I'm one way or the other on it. But it's just like, what is that if it's not real? <laughs> yeah. But what they do? Who did that? And you know that kind of thing. I mean, I bet, I've been to the Sistine Chapel, and I'm, I'm, I'm about, I'm awe inspired by that. You know, yeah. I'm awe inspired by what Leonardo da Vinci did. I mean, so these guys were just they're they're on another 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 mm -hmm. another playing field. You know, mm -hmm. these aren't Justin Trudeau's. You know, these are these are some really incredible, <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> individuals. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about uh, what's going on in Jordan right now, and uh, are you planning to go back after the, uh, you know, after COVID is over, and just what your tell us a little bit about what you do there and working with the refugees and at the seminary. Yeah, <clears throat> inshallah, I, I uh, God willing, I uh, want to go back. Uh, not to live, I'll, I'll go back maybe in, my, in the summers in between my semesters when I'm teaching. I want to go back and I can do, you know, like a two-week teaching and training thing. I have a lot of great connections there. 
<clears throat> the school there that I taught at was amazing. It's called Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary, and uh, they're training Arabs for the Arab world and just solid. You know, it's DTS based in, in its theology, the Dallas Theological Seminary, where I graduated from. And so teaching there was just just an extraordinary privilege, and I'm still teaching there online and when I'm needed. Uh, and I was also working with refugees, and so uh, you know when I got there, this was at the height of refugees fleeing ISIS to Jordan, <clears throat> and so this was mainly refugees from Syria, Iraq, and uh, Yemen. Uh, most most Iraqi refugees were Christians. Most Syrian were Muslim. Yemeni were Muslim, <clears throat> and so. Uh, just spending time with them, humanitarian efforts. Um, I don't know if you heard of uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata has a has a ministry called Johnny and Friends, <clears throat> and they go all around the world. But they go to Jordan every year, and they're they're the ones actually physically making um, wheelchairs for the disabled and for for uh, and, and you know, just about everybody that comes to us are Muslim. And so they're just, they're just amazed at this because the Muslims and even the Muslim government aren't doing this. You know, there's no Muslim charity <laughs> that is uh, making wheelchairs for the disabled. They just kind of put the disabled back in the back room and just ignore them. Um, and so, and so, you know, this is one of the one of the number one ways that I, I saw Muslims coming to Christ was them seeing that compassion, seeing that that love of Christ. Uh, but I did have a lot of great intellectual. You know, discussions and, and one Muslim I had a great intellectual discussion with for many you know many months and he, he ended up coming to Christ I baptized him in the Jordan River that was that was an awesome privilege he's, he's back in Syria now but um, but yeah it was a amazing opportunity and, and from Jordan I got to go visit you know they have this thing called Ryanair real cheap uh, plane tickets to go all over Europe and things so I got to go to I saw the saw the pyramids. Got to go to the Cairo Museum. Got to go to England. Got to go to Italy. So it was a, it was a little blessing. Travel with you, man. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was a blessing. <coughs> and the old cheapo airlines. So. <laughs> Fourteen dollars a ticket. I mean, it was just insane. <coughs> wow. They make you flap your wings to help the air fuel economy there. Right? They they don't allow you to like take anything on the board though. Yeah. Justin, I, I was just I just uh, interviewed Gary Habermas uh, in January, and then just a couple of weeks ago, and Gary and I were talking about his volume that's coming out on the resurrection. He's got, uh, uh, I think he said the second volume um, <coughs> is just on naturalistic explanations for the resurrection. Um, in all the things that you've looked at, what are what are the most common? Explanations. Uh, Gary told me he said that scholars generally today the trend is nobody's taking a position on actually having an explanation as to what happened. People are actually more just saying something happened. We don't know. That, that's yeah. is that is that that's what I've seen. Yeah, yeah, you're just finding that you don't want to take a particular position on a hallucination. Yeah, I call it, I called it cautious agnosticism. You know, they just you know I know something happened. <laughs> But I don't know what happened. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, E.P. Sanders, great New Testament scholar, that's basically how he ends this big book on called Jesus and Judaism. He says, you know, that the effect of the movement of, you know, the effect of these appearances are unique. You know, they're they're they caused this movement that went on to mm. to dominate mm. the Roman Empire and the world. What actually caused it? He he, end, he literally ends the book by saying, I don't know. Yeah. The other fascinating thing Gary told me was that. In Christianity, Jesus is revered in other religions, not quite as God, but Christianity does not revere other gods. And so yeah. Jesus is the only human being where he's he's uh, pluralistically, if you will, acknowledged in uh, in all other faiths. In your experience in the Middle East, what did how did you see on the ground? How did you know Islamic world um, as you engage people? How did they? How did what was the general perception of, of people's impression of Jesus? I know the Quran speaks of Isa. Yeah. But what do what do Muslims actually say about about Jesus that you've seen? They pretty much I found that Muslims, even educated ones, would only know basically <clears throat> a little bit in the from the Quran about Jesus. They didn't know the Gospels. They didn't know you know much about you know there, there's there's people out there like Abu Ali and and uh, I mean uh, what's his name uh, the guy that debates a lot Shabir Ali Shabir Ali, Shabir Ali. Shabir Ali. Shabir Ali. Yeah. <laughs> Shabir Ali and uh, people like that who's reading like Raymond Brown and <laughs> who's definitely re reading the Gospels and he knows but vast majority I would I would estimate of Muslims do not know 
the Gospels. They're encouraged not to read you know, the Gospels in the, in the actual Bible, the Old Testament. And so what they know is a little bit about Jesus that they have from the Quran. But, but I, always, I even joked, you know, I said, you know, I'd love to go to a mosque where they actually do a sermon or a, whatever they call it when they, when they preach from the Quran. And it's about Isa today. <laughs> Because it's amazing, because you know I've read the Quran multiple times, and it really is amazing because Jesus in the Quran is raising the dead, is healing the sick, is virgin born, is the Messiah. John the Baptist is saying he's coming. Here's the Messiah. It's Jesus, um, and and Muslim, it's not in the Quran, but Muslims actually believe Jesus is going to return. Uh, so so you know they they like to say that Muhammad was the last prophet, but really Jesus is the last prophet because he's the one they're looking for. Uh, Jesus is going to return in the sky and kill the Antichrist. That's what, that's what Muslims believe today. So, you know, it's amazing that Jesus is elevated to this incredible level uh, in the Quran. And this is one of my bedrock, common ground things that I would do with Muslims. I would take them to uh, a certain surah in the Quran that talks about how Jesus is the Word of God. And it's Kalimat Allah. You know, it's, it's the actual same, word, same phrase that's used in the Arabic version of John 1 1. So when it says the word was God, it's the same word in Arabic in the Quran for Jesus is the word of God. And there's all these different interpretations, even going back to uh, the Middle Ages, Muslims were interpreting it as Jesus was this kind of almost close to divine figure. Wow. So, I mean, and I, and I would ask them, if Jesus is the word of God, when was when did Allah not have his word? That's you know, one of my questions I'd ask them. Uh, there's, there's just no... There's no answers for it. So they, they, there's a, a minimal cultural understanding of the Quran for a lot of Muslims um, in terms of Isa and the Injil and yeah, that. specifically Jesus. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't know exactly how much uh, that they would know the Quran. There was, of course, many nominal Muslims who just didn't, who just probably recited it each. But people who actually studied it probably knew the Quran. But I noticed about Jesus, though, that's something that they just. They were aware that he's called the word, but they hadn't really thought about it until I brought mm. the challenge and said, mm. "What is? What are the implications of that? How is he the word of God? He's a human. Yeah. How is he the word of God? Yeah. And how did he? How did he do these miracles? How did he raise the dead? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so from the Quran, I think you could, you know, you could. Absolutely. There's a great bridge to, yeah. to get them to then, Benjil, get them to the Gospels. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Interesting uh, that uh, you have. People like uh, Shabir Ali and other Muslim apologists who, you know, want to uh, like somewhat minimize the the gospel accounts because, you know, they were written way too late, uh, decades later, and uh, uh, by sources we don't completely know who, and so they're, they're making those complaints. Uh, at, but the source that teaches that. Jesus was not crucified is a obscure passage in a document that was written some 800 miles away over 500 years later. So that's going to trump all the stuff that we have very early on, including, as you, you point out, uh, you know, Paul's writing about the crucified, resurrected Christ, uh, that uh, the creed he quotes can go back to, you said, possibly within months of the crucifixion. That's right. But yeah, that's exactly. where the Quran by faith trumps everything else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If they, if they, if they, they're, they're going to accept the Quran over, over anything and everything else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's kind, of, it's kind of like you know James could speak to this. You know, the fact that Mormons, you know, even if you can show them the DNA evidence contradicts what the Book of Mormon says, what what are they going to do? I, I'm still going to stick with the Book of Mormon. I don't, I don't care what the DNA says, right? Yeah. And that, that's that's. So, so, so we see people go completely irrational. That's what's beautiful about Christianity. We don't have to be irrational. The evidence supports is it is at least consistent with what we believe. This is what Dale Allison. This is what I mean. Even Bart Ehrman, they they've admitted that the evidence does not contradict the miracle. I don't believe that. I don't believe that we can follow. They they would say I don't believe we can follow the evidence to a miracle, but the evidence doesn't. Con it's consistent with the miracle. That's how Dale Allison. Mm -hmm. is. Okay. Let me ask you a question. You just articulated how big an impact culture has on your beliefs. Mm -hmm. And we, the problem with all of us is we grow up in this culture. We're swimming in a Christian culture. Yeah. And my thing is <clears throat> even smart people cannot escape cultural bias. So if you were born in Saudi Arabia, 
do you think he would be a Muslim and you were tell us how scientifically accurate the Quran is? Don't you think he would be a totally different, have a totally different belief system? I think I probably would. I probably would have grown up <coughs> being passionate about the Quran. I probably would have been that way. And like Neil Bill Qureshi, I would have had an opportunity to hear about the gospel, and I would have ended up looking at the evidence and becoming a Christian. <clears throat> okay, so you think you can escape the cultural? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I, here, my, it goes back to a foundational belief that I have, which is if you seek, you will find. So I believe, you know, Acts 17, uh, Paul says to the philosophers in Athens, God made <clears throat> one man every nation of men and he made them to be born exactly where he wanted them to be so that they would reach out to him. He is not far from each one of us. So, someone born in Saudi Arabia, someone born in China, someone born in America, they're all not far from God. I think God will give them, if they seek the truth, if they seek the, the, the truth, beauty, and goodness in God, whether they know how much of that there is, and like a, a, a genuine Muslim, I think if a Muslim is truly seeking God, kind of like Cornelius, Cornelius was seeking God, and what happened? Uh, Peter was sent to him and he preached the gospel to him. Yeah, Bill, Bill you yes. and I are both living proof of that because you, you were born and raised in a total Christian culture and you escaped that to become an atheist. And I was a Latter day Saint, fourth generation, just totally immersed in that culture. And uh, here I am a Christian. So uh, just here in the meeting right now, uh, a number of us have showed that that, uh, that culture doesn't lock you in necessarily. Exception. But anyway, um, it's about one the guy we it's had. About the it's about the evidence. One guy we had was John Loftus, who I'm sure you're familiar with. He, one of his great contributions is the outsider test of faith, that the way we get our belief system is two things, our peers, our family, and our you know, culture. So what he's saying is that's what determines your belief system. And I think that his outsider test of faith is pretty solid. What do you think? Well, I think, could, could you expand on that a little bit more? Because I may have a real strong counterexample. But uh, that what you the way our beliefs are determined is your uh -huh. family circle uh -huh. and your environment. Your like, look at here. We're in Envi Dallas. Environment has a lot of aspects. Oh my! Okay. Look at look okay. here. We're in the yeah. buckle okay. of the Bible. We have seven seminaries. We have okay. radio stations. We have all this bias hitting us. Okay. So at seventeen, I was a sitting duck. Yeah. I had no. <laughs> it wasn't me that accepted the cry. It was my culture that. Was. Go right. ahead. Right. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, in northern Ghana, in the village I lived for a while, there's, I'll talk about um, one of the guys who became a Christian, and because outside uh, missionaries for the Sudan Interior Mission actually came in and started teaching about Jesus, and he didn't have um, his friends, Christians, he had zero Christians, and he had uh, no, none of the radio or anything like that, of course, too. Um, so he, he did have, the only influence of the environment he has is these outside people coming and talking to him, really. Um, I asked him, it was the first time I went there, he says, you know, what difference has Christ made in your life? But he had been following the traditional um, African or local tradition of sacrificing to the ancestors. Uh, when things went wrong, the thing is you, you keep on sacrificing to the ancestors and you're never quite sure if you've done enough until something goes wrong, then you know you haven't done enough. So he had lost several children and one wife. He was polygamous in the society there. And he was just getting desperate. And he turned his life over to Christ. And he says it just made an incredible difference. He actually lost another child, but he said, um, he wouldn't put it in this term, but his, he had the peace of God in his life there. So there's, there's different ways people can kind of get exposed to that. And sometimes it's really, um, really um, present in the environment like, like here in Dallas area and sometimes some areas of the world it's just not there until somebody comes and tells them like that and and I, my, my challenge how I would throw down the gauntlet against the outsider test would be I, and I've done this in lectures I can show you solid intellectuals who've written books who've investigated these things people from every different religion who that when they investigated everything, no matter where they were born, whether it was China, whether it was India, 
whether it was Africa, when they studied everything, they ended up becoming a Christian. And so the, the question then is, can any other religion claim that? And I would say they can. You can't find, you can't find solid uh, intellectual books written by someone that was Christian that then became Buddhist, that was Muslim that then became Buddhist, that was uh, Jewish and then became Buddhist. You can't do that with Islam. You can't do that with uh, Hinduism, but you can do that with Christianity. And that, that to me would be a sign that Christianity is something different. It's, something, it's a truly world religion. It has somehow captured the hearts and minds of people <coughs> in every tongue and nation. And I'll, so I'll add to that because the gospel in, in our area of Ghana there is not Jesus or God loves you and has a wonderful <coughs> plan for your life. That's a really nice American way of looking at it. Um, but it's like Jesus is more powerful than any spirit and he is the final and ultimate sacrifice. And so they're into a sacrifice system. They have the spirits that they relate to. And so that's the kind of thing that really uh, relates to them. Now, the, the next step in both of those is you need to turn to Christ individually. And that's that's where the, the paths converge, I think. But you don't start out the same place with those folks because they're not coming from the same place. Well, what's disturbing to me, I had a Christian missionary who was uh -huh. translating the Bible like you're, you do. Uh -huh. And you know what he said? He goes, guys, you, we have got to get on this mission field because whoever gets there first, whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll become a Jehovah's Witness. If it's a Mormon who gets there first, they're becoming Mormon. Did you see that? Well, we had a more isolated situation, and we were the only ones there. Oh, okay. So, uh, have you seen that, <laughs> We got there first, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So, yeah I, but again, it, it goes some back truth to, to that. It but, goes back to if you're truly seeking, you will find. Yeah. <clears throat> and there, there, there were Muslims there, too. Uh, and some of them turned to Christ, and I don't know the current situation. I haven't been back there for a few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But it was, it was interesting just to see how they um, really, they, they took whatever the religion they are, they took it a whole lot more seriously than most Americans do with whatever we've got, too. Um, yeah. I talked about how the, you know, we do see the church declining in the West, but it's it's on fire in places like China, South Korea. Uh, there was even South Korean missionaries in Jordan, Christian, well, Christian missionaries um, in Africa, in, uh, in, in, Latin, in Latin America, <coughs> Brazil. <coughs> so, so it seems like God is moving the church all around the world, and because the West is largely become the Church of Laodicea, <laughs> the cross is moving to a different to a different region. And we may see the church become the dominant church like in China and the Far East, and they'll be sending missionaries to the West to try to win yeah. Us, yeah, us, us Justin Trudeau's. One Christ. of the problems is like T B M the heresy is being spread to these third world what one year. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's always a part of it. Yeah. yeah. Just some prosperity <laughs> false gospel. And that's yeah. the gospel they're pretty it's saying. Yeah, yeah, not all, but yeah. yeah. Uh, just, just to have a question that. about the uh, uh, on the books being written uh, uh, from converts from Islam and other religions to Christianity. Um, uh, the only, of course, there are converts of, that were Christian that converted to Islam and other religions, and some of them do write some books about it. You can find, but are you saying that for the most part they're they're not academic in nature? Or are you saying that? that um, there's just uh, overwhelming more of those books than there are, um, um, or, or uh, fewer of those books than there are Christian books showing from other religions converting to Christianity. Yeah, I mean, my, my challenge, and I could be, I could be proven wrong, but, but I, I, I wish I had the slide with me here, but I have a slide where I show all these books, uh, books like Neil, Nabil Qureshi's Seeking All of Finding Jesus, uh, a guy named Laman Sani, he was a guy that uh, was a professor at Yale until uh, 2019. He died, but he was born in Gambia. <laughs> Never heard the gospel. <clears throat> Actually came to Christ through reading the Quran, and uh, he ended up finding missionaries. And uh, Lama Sani has been, a, you know, Christian all the way to his death um, in 2019. Uh, he wrote "Whose Religion Is Christianity?" A ton of other books. Um, uh, Francis Collins, uh, not the best example during COVID, but still uh, an atheist that came to Christ um, uh, by reading C.S. Lewis. Um, who else do I have? Uh, oh, yeah, Lin Yutang, uh, from pagan to Christian. He was born in China, uh, was a Confucianist, was a Buddhist, and a, and a master, like, 
you know, wrote, wrote tons of books, was an intellectual, and, it's, and at, uh, in his 60s, he came to Christ. <laughs> and, he, and he wrote some of those beautiful things you could ever imagine in that book from Pagan to Christian. So my challenge is, show me that with another religion. So yeah, th- yeah, there are examples of maybe a, a Christian converting to Islam or uh, this person converting to this religion, but show me where somebody converted to, from all those religions to one religion. You could, you could do that with atheism because people from all these different religions have come out of those religions and many of them have become atheists. But I'm saying with other religions. So this is a challenge for other religions. I'm saying in the context of my lecture, I'm, I'm talking about how Christianity is unique, uniquely a world religion, that with one true world religion, and it's the only one who can do that. So, so I don't include atheism in that, in that category. So you'd have to find a Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, you know, you have to find one of those where you have all of those people convert to those religions. And like I said, this, you know, you could prove me wrong on this, but I've yet to see that. I think Terry has a question, too. I, we're about out of time, but I think Terry has a question if you wanted to unmute Terry. Along that line, I don't think, I think that what you're confusing or how I feel that you're kind of confusing is that Christianity is big business. You got lots of missionaries going to lots of places. Way back as far as I was a kid, my uncle did that. Um, I don't think Buddhists do that. I don't think Hindus do that. I think they feel very confident in their own um, beliefs, and they're not really interested in uh, um, converting others. Uh, you know, they're certainly welcoming some of the most welcoming people that I know, but they're not. Their their job is not to go out and gather the the flocks. And so I think it's kind of unfair to compare those two things. We there's more don't money. You, don't, you, don't you think Krishna wants people outside of India to worship him? I don't think they're out there um, proselytizing. proselytizing that. At least certainly not the one. But, 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 right, I, I see your point, but don't, don't you see my point? I mean, isn't that amazing though that if there are these other gods, you'd think they'd want to be worshipped by people outside of the one place that they've been basically since the beginning. So like, for example, Hinduism, Krishna and all these gods have been worshiped near the Ganges River in India. That's where it's been for 3000 years. If they were real, you'd think that they would be able to go beyond the borders of India. So that, that's why I'm saying it's not a world religion. It's a, it's a religion of India. See, it's a, it's a religion of India. It's a man-made religion. In contrast, the Christian God who actually says my gospel will go to all nations. I'm going to bring every tribe and tongue into worshiping me, is doing that. We see people from every nation worshiping Yahweh, worshiping Jesus Christ. And so that, I think, is a reason to believe that this may be the one true religion. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. And um, unfortunately, I, I let Bill down because I am in Arlington and we couldn't come today. So I let my, my, my friend down there, but um, yes, I, I don't think that, that uh, you know, there, there was something on the, uh, the Daily Wire today about people leaving Christianity right now in droves. And so I in the think, West, yeah. yeah, so I don't think that that's a fair, I don't think that's a fair statement, um, you know, and I don't think that, I, I think it is probably more because there is more money in Christianity than there is in, uh, you know, go look at where those Buddhists live and how they live or, or go on to the, um, go over to the, to the temple in Dallas and see how the Hindus live. They're doing it because that's their heart. They're, they're not, and, and they're not, they're not that interested in, in uh, pulling you in. Like I said, if you, if you want to come in by God, you can, but, it's a it's a different culture. And what, what, and what is that? And what is that power? What is that? What is that inspiration that's pushing these people to go all over the world and share this faith? Money. Why are why are, why are Christians doing it? That's a good question. You think mission, missionaries are rich people? <laughs> I um, could show you a few thousand others. Probably not, but the I, but I think it's the church. The churches that they represent probably are. Why is it their business what someone else believes? I mean, you know. 
That's well, well, a that's good question there. Why, mean, why do Christians want to spread their religions question. and other other religions? Well, they're commanded. Care. Go and make no. Well, at the see, let me finish my question, which is tying into what you're interrupting. <laughs> but yeah, so Christians that have commi- been commanded to go, and they think that people's eternal destiny depends on this, mm-hmm. and most are uh, the others. Not so much. I mean, it says, okay, they have an idea that, okay, well, you, well, no matter what you're going to do, you, you, you may go through different life cycles, different life, and so forth like that. But it really doesn't depend, it more depends on your behavior, for example, for reincarnation, rather than your belief system. And so it really doesn't matter so much if you follow Buddhism as long as you're a nice person, right? Yeah. And, and just to me, you know, a test of the one true religion would be the religion that captures hearts and minds of every culture and nation on the planet. So if a religion only captures the hearts and minds of Indians, people from India, yeah. or people from the Far East, or like Confucianism, you know, people from China, or uh, Scientology, people from California, you know, those crazy people. You know, if, 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 oh boy. if, it only, if a religion only captures a certain segment of people, it's probably a man-made, you know, certain kind of, you know, like man constructed religion but if it captures hearts and minds of all peoples but if it captures the hearts and minds of peoples from all, all the world which Christianity uniquely does I would just say it, it gives a strong push towards this may be the one true religion but yeah the reason that we go to everybody is because Jesus commanded us because again because it's the one true religion it's the only way to salvation and it's the only way to deal with you and I and everyone in here's biggest problem which is death and sin. We have a sin problem and we have a death problem. And Jesus is the only one who took care of that. Not Krishna, not Buddha, not Muhammad, definitely not uh, Charles Taze Russell or you know Joseph Smith or uh, uh, who was the guy behind Solomon Scientology? I can't remember his name. Tom oh. Cruise. Tom Cruise. That's right. Yeah, Tom Cruise didn't solve the death problem and the sin problem. Only Jesus did. But, but Oprah, Oprah may be the answer, actually. <laughs> But, I mean, you just have to, I, I, I see what you're saying, but, but you have to see that Christianity is at least unique in these aspects. That's what I'm saying. Well, I'll just respectfully disagree. I, I, I think that, um, you know, I think that all religions are, are man-made to a degree, and I think you have to look at what your values are when you choose one. And for some people, that's uh, the suffering that the Buddhists talk about. For Hindus, it's... Um, it's, it's doing the right thing, being on the right path to raise yourself up. Not in one life. You can't, you can't raise yourself out of the lowest caste system. In multiple lives you can, right? Well, and Terry, <laughs> Terry you know, Ken Daniels, who's a member of this group, by the way, he wrote a great book, Why I Believe, Missionary to Africa. And he was like, no, put me in the hottest parts of Africa. He was not, wouldn't you agree, you know him more than I do, he's not motivated by money, correct? I don't think so. No. He's got a job that pays now, but I mean, yeah. he got to. He's, I, you just get a feel for somebody, yeah. and he was just simply deluded. Yeah. And that's and I, th- I think there are some Christians that, that are motivated by money, and there, yeah. there are some examples of that. But I think as a movement as a whole, over the last 2,000 years, I think it's pretty clear if you look at the people who actually have taken the gospel to new nations and new peoples, it wasn't about money. And they had some pretty rough, terrible... Experience it's like death, those Moravians who actually sold themselves into slavery to preach the gospel yeah. in Jamaica. That's right. They're yeah. an extreme example. And you're not in it for the money, right? No, I'm I just, you know, they, they, my churches support me to the turn of $3 million a year, but I'm not in it for the money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this is glad to hear that. The point is that the churches that are pouring all this money in uh, to missions, they're not reaping any financial no. benefit from no. it. I mean, it's, I mean, I know churches that are giving very large percentages of their of their uh, annual budget to missions, and they get no financial returns. Right. Right. They, they want to see souls saved. Yeah. You know, K- Kerry said. makes the point that, you know, just because something is successful, because there's more books published or something like that, doesn't necessarily mean it's true. If you went to first century Corinth, you would think that... Uh, Artemis was doing quite a bit better, more popular than Jesus was. But, but I think the point that uh, maybe that uh, Justin is making here is that while a worldwide impact doesn't prove it's true, it may not it may not prove it. It, it would be 
may be necessary but not sufficient. In other words, you would be suspect. This is what separates all the real failed apocalyptic uh, prophets of the first century to someone who transformed uh, not just Western civilization, but ultimately the whole world. Uh, if it was true, you would expect to see that kind of world impact. Doesn't prove it's true. You know, you could have a world impact with something that's not true. But if you didn't have that, if you had uh, 2,000 years later, there were 300 followers of Jesus scattered around the world, uh, that would also uh, speak to the improbability that it really was what it claimed to be. Uh, does, does that make sense? Exactly. And just to add on that, in addition to that, we have not just in the Old Testament, but Jesus himself saying this gospel will go to every nation, tribe, and tongue. So we know what he wanted to happen. So when Artemis was the thing, when Dionysus, Dionysius was the thing, you had Jesus saying that this gospel will go to every nation, tribe, and tongues. And, and now 2,000 years later, we look around the world. This It's not been fulfilled yet, but it is in every way is showing itself to be fulfilled. No, that proves that the gospels weren't written until recently because Jesus could not have made that prediction ahead of time. Therefore, the gospels had to have been written in the 19th or 18th century after the gospel had gone to all the world. <laughs> They were written in the 1990s. My goodness, the Gospels were written contemporary with Vanilla Ice and MC Hammer. I can't believe it. Well, I agree to you. It should give you pause that it is the world's largest religion. It's not pause. In different but cultures. Remember, Christianity would not be the world's largest religion if it wasn't for the genius of Paul who made it accessible with, you can eat a pork sandwich now, you can... It really, he, it, it, he, it would have been a small Jewish sect where you'd have to just, the, the church in Jerusalem, where you had to keep those dietary laws, be circumcised, and it would have never been. He would, say, he would say the genius of Jesus. You know, would have been are hard, they're hard to prove. It's the genius Would have been are hard to prove. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can't what, say what, what is, would yeah. have been. And, and, and one of my fun hypotheticals that I like to say is, you know, okay, now suddenly let's think, you know, we live in a world where, let, let's let's say, you know, you're right right now. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. All right, we live in a world where Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Now, what would the world have looked like if he did rise from the dead? You mean if he rose right now, you mean? No, no, no. If, if, oh. if he, no, no. Well, let's assume the atheists are right. Okay. Let's assume the atheists are right. Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and this is what the world looks like. Christianity is the largest movement in the world. We swim in it, all the stuff we've been talking about. Now, let's say, what if he actually did rise from the dead? What would the world have looked like? I'm not sure I follow you. I, I think it looks, it would He's look like, it looks kind of the same. It looks yeah. like, okay. it does now. Okay. <laughs> so that's my point. Like it's, no, it's like what, what else yeah. would, the, I mean, yeah. what, yeah. what more would have happened? Okay. Like would, would, would Christianity have 6 million followers? Would that, I mean, you got to have some kind of standard. Yeah. I mean, you see what I'm saying? We're, I mean, Christianity has reached the highest standard of all, you know, you could put empirical data on for a religion. Our time has slipped away from us, and it's the fastest two hours in uh, of, of my month, usually. So I want to say, uh, uh, Justin, thanks so much for being our guest author th this month at the Atheist and Christian Book Club. A quick announcement, we will not be having a club in June. Uh, we're going to take a, a summer break from that for some other things that are on the calendar. We will be back on July, and so on July 7th, uh, our next book club, our book's going to be The Historical Christ and the Theological Jesus by Dale Allison, and this has been a much requested book from some of our uh, atheist members, uh, or author, I should say. Uh, he will be joining us by Zoom. It will be a Zoom-only meeting. Uh, Dr. Allison. Thank you, James. Dr. Allison is a uh, professor of New Testament uh, at, at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, he earned an MA and PhD from Duke University. His academic research has focused on historical Jesus, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, the, uh, the Saints Gospels, or the, the, the hypothetical Q document, uh, early Jewish Christian eschatology. Um, his book, Constructing Jesus, uh, was selected as best book uh, related to the New Testament for, uh, by Biblical Archaeology Society. Uh, on a more popular level, he's written books on the Sermon on the Mount, 
uh, of uh, George Harrison. And I, I hope we get to talk a little bit about the spirituality of George Harrison uh, when we when we talk with Dale. Hindu. He's also, uh, yeah, yeah, Hare Krishna in uh, Eastern religion. And so uh, he, he's written on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and, and he's written a lot on death and afterlife. And uh, he's, uh, he's kind of a real uh, um, paradoxical kind of guy. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to asking him some questions. He seems to, at points, believe in a historical resurrection. Uh, other times, he seems to be very skeptical on a lot as well. So uh, with all that, he's an ordained elder in the uh, Presbyterian Church USA. And so anyway, he's going to be great. Uh, he, he's a well-respected author, writer, and I'm looking forward to meeting with him. That's going to be, again, be July 7th. And we're going to, is the book again is The Historical Christ and the Theological Jesus. It's only about 140 pages and it's less than $20. So it should be a quick read, but give us some real food for being able to ask some questions and, and pick his uh, brain. So look forward to that. Uh, Ju uh, Justin, do you have any final um, uh, words for both the atheist uh, and the Christians uh, for the club? Any advice or, or final word? For the, for the Christians, I'll quote Jesus, be holy as, as your heavenly Father is holy. That's, that's, I think holiness is what we need more than anything. Knowledge. We need apologetics. We need arguments. But we need holiness uh, for the Christians. And then for the atheists, I would say uh, there there are more things in heaven and earth ratio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. So look, open your eyes, and, and humble your hearts, and uh, open just open your hearts to the possibility of the, the wonderful and the, and the scary and, and miraculous. Follow the evidence where it leads. Well. Thank you so much, Justin. On behalf of our other co-founder, Bill Cluck, my name is James Walker, thanking you for being part of this month's Atheist and Christian Book Club. Thanks so much.